What's up? What's up? Could I make advanced level command have one as a default argument? I could, yeah. Certainly a possibility. Certainly a possibility. First, I'm going to fix this because we, we did this thing this morning, and it turned out this this stupid suggestion. Well, it's it's good in in it, some context, but bad in many others. So we have to make it not fire in the others. And I thought of a couple ways to do it. And one involves flagging a thing with an extra flag, but I'm going to try it a different way that is wackier. And we're going to see if it works. <laughs> uh, Okay, so we're going to say no check-in. Comment this. It is wacky if it stays. Okay, so if inside type slot, we do this. Okay, bool inside type slot is false. And then we do wackiness. No, because we have flattened with it. Aha. Inst flattened within. So what I'm doing, so one way to know whether this is in the type slot of a declaration is to like flag it at some previous stage during type checking. And the annoying thing about that is that's just to make this error message. You don't need that to do the semantics of the language. And so you're introducing a global concept. It has to exist as flag. It has to exist potentially on the data structure. It has to be performed at a remote place in the code just for something to kick in if an error happens. And like you're, you're paying for it by setting the flag for every single declaration. And so instead, I'm going to look at the data structure representing what we're analyzing and see if I can find a declaration in there. So we're going to look for a declaration Okay Um static cast as declaration expert if Inst is equal to decal type inst inside type slot is true. Okay. Okay, bro. Ah, 
Why do I keep doing this? I'm going to change this today. Okay. I'm going to change that today. Okay. Well, let's see what happens here. Hey. Oh. This error message is wrong. Okay. Boom. Okay, so we're just going to change the phrasing. If we're in the type slot of a declaration, otherwise in, uh, just here we need a constant type. There we go. There we go. So very simple. Now let's go back to the thing that we were doing. Like we were doing stuff like, uh, well, a colon seven, right? There we go. Now we actually detected that it's a declaration. Ha ha. However, remember when I was saying that this would be a stupid error if we if there was something in the value slot but we couldn't tell because we didn't have the declaration now we have the declaration so it's even better this is giving us super functionality uh so we're going to go ask declaration inside inside this decal and then inside this decal is decal, right? So we're gonna say inside, if we're inside this decal, we do that. Uh, what? Okay, so if we're inside this declaration and there's no expression, And Sid, dude, my typing is so bad lately. All right, there we go. Okay, so there we got it. But what if we say a colon seven equals five? Then it doesn't do it, baby. Ah, that's so much better. So much better. This is not slipways. Look, man. I don't want to have a lame galaxy like Muratorixy. We might play Slipways tonight. We'll see. I just, I wanted to try to get through all these bugs because I did a tremendous amount on the compiler this week, but um, some of it was really deep internal stuff and the emails with bug reports had been piling up and I was just like, oh, no big deal. I've got like three or four days of those. No, the oldest ones were nine days old. And I am not, uh, what's the guy's name who runs Canonical? I am not the guy who runs Canonical I do not let bugs pile up for 17 years, or maybe I'm just not Microsoft. So we're trying to crank through them. Everyone left because no slipways. Well, maybe everyone left because there was no stream. I will put forward that thesis. Mark Shuttle, I am not Mark Shuttleworth. I promise something tricky. Let's do something tricky. Uh, let me check this in first. Remind me again, as soon as I do the check-in, to do something tricky. We have to go comment this. It'll just take a couple minutes. Uh, this is wacky, but we are doing it to encapsulate, encapsulate 
encapsulate complexity here rather than introducing a global flag that gets set in some cases and well we would even need a backup data structure telling us what the declaration even is to get the same functionality as we have here. Uh, this is ram rambly. And we are avoiding paying in successful compilation, compilation performance for something that only needs to happen on errors. Basically, we are searching ahead in the flattened expressions to find a declaration we may be inside. If we find it, we modify our error message appropriately to make it better. Um, we stop after the first declaration because I am pretty sure they don't nest that way, but that break is not strictly necessary. 3 May 2020. Okay, great, bro. Why is Visual Studio scrolled on the right? Like this is what people try to make editors that are smart and they do this all the time. And it's like, what are you even doing? Why do you think I want to see the right-hand side of this one comment line in this giant program? Why don't you just word wrap like a reasonable thing? Okay, let's make sure we didn't, oh, let's make release, make sure we didn't break anything and go. How much additional complexity do you have to add to the compiler in order for error messages to be expressive? What do you mean? If you mean the current error messages that we have, um, the answer is, uh, Usually it's spot complexity. Like usually it's just some if statements, right? Where you're, you're trying to report the error message. Um, in this case, whoops, uh, test. In this case, it would have involved having something more global. And I've done things like that a few times and I don't like it. I, I don't like what that does to the complexity of the system over time and the difficulty of understanding things. Um, and so I, tried to do an alternative thing in this case, and it worked out great. Do the Slipways dude ever come around these parts? Um, I don't know who the Slipways dude is. I don't know what his Twitch name is. So, uh, okay. You know, after all this, the tricky thing I was going to do is not actually going to be all that great, but we'll do it because you can't do it in C++. Um, uh, improved, improved error message. We can't add that to the change log because we already claimed in the change log that that error message was good. I can scribble it off my list though. Okay, the thing that we're gonna do is just remember in the meta program, remember that in the previous stream where we did this thing where we're passing this procedure info that by the way, we're gonna take out, I guess, next pass anyway, <laughs> but we did this. Um, so, we're passing the name twice here. And instead of going passing the name twice, we could pass it once and just use, uh, sorry, that's probably two. I think we start from one. Just use the same number twice. I mean, we don't even need to do that. There you go, babe. So now we can go Help Ocean, and it still knows all about it. All right. What did we do in develop? Oh, we added, we took out to toggle no clip, and we're not checking that in. Okay. Yeah, there is word wrap option. It's disabled by default. Yeah, that's great. That means it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned.
did I need that cast in there? This one? I feel like... I feel like I do. I shouldn't. Oh, oh, maybe not anymore, right, because uh, of that overload thing. Right, okay. Okay. I want to figure out what to do about that overload thing. Um, you know, I don't think it would be... It's a weird problem. You know what? I'm not going to think about it that much right now because I'd rather go work on what we're working on. But um, we're going to take this back out anyway and just generate the info string in the meta program next time. So uh, I think focusing on doing a good job of that would be the, the next step. But we're back here at the user bugs, the beta user bugs, the beta user bugs. OK. This causes an internal compiler error, according to a beta user. Let's see. Well, I mean, before we get there, we're hitting an assertion, but that, that proves it. So we're parsing. This is in the parser, um, which is going to be an easy fix, because parsers, the parser is just not complicated compared to the rest of the compiler. Um, so it doesn't, he kind of was doing like a C style cast here. Um, and well, th this syntax is just a path that nobody's really tried, right? So um, let's see, let's see what, how we're getting confused. So we're trying to parse a statement, we call parse block. And um, we're not really checking. I guess parse block can return null without reporting an error. I mean, under what condition does parse block, oh, it returns null here. Mm, I'm confused because this, this looks like this would report an error. Oh, this, this does null report parse error. This does report parse error. Okay, it must be this. So we should report a parse error here. And we should also note at the top that that's not optional. So note, if this routine returns null, it should report parse error. A little bit redundant, but okay. Okay, so braces are optional. Report parse error. Um, Lexer uh, token um, expected open brace here, period. So like, and then at the, at the calling site, it also looked like we were expecting, um, oh yeah, we return if we report a parse error, otherwise we expect the block to be there. So that was a parser bug. Uh, it was easily fixed. And now you see why I don't think parser generators are a good idea because you invest heavily in this Byzantine system and like this is what working on a parser is. It was just, 
It was just like a straight marriage, okay? We just went and, you know, you know, uh, let's make sure we didn't break anything. I doubt it. That seems very, uh, very stable. We'll go to the change log and we'll say, um, fixed a uh, parser crash that can happen with uh, weird attempts at syntax. With weird invalid program syntax. There we go. Okay, we are we're making progress. We're doing better than the Free Software Foundation at fixing bugs. Something like that. Okay. Okay. How is SIMD support? Uh, we have no SIMD support at all. Um, it might be time to think about that a little bit, honestly. The thing is just, um, there's basically two routes. Right. Route number one is do something really boring where, you know, we go put in all the AVX intrinsics or all the SSE or something like that. Right. Just like literally put them all in and make them work in all three places that they need to work, which is the LLVM backend, the uh, X64 backend and the runtime evaluator. And that's annoying, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, so that's one way. And the other way is to try to do something better. Like we were talking about, like maybe there's some subset of intrinsics that could just be cross platform or that, you know, that if they map to something a little bit different on arm or something that it's still pretty efficient, like, Oh, this one instruction that's a chunk of cycles maps to two instructions that are roughly about that many size. You know, you know what I mean? The, the problem is I am not uh, SIMD educated enough to make that call. Uh, and I've also just been very busy. So just yesterday, I managed to make a structural change to the compiler that has been a long time coming. And in January, I would have told you probably wouldn't happen this year. <laughs> Uh, but you know, sitting around my apartment all day lets things happen. And so, so now that that kind of heavy stuff is done, um, and, and I'm not that scared of certain things in the compiler anymore being robust. Um, it really opens doors to thinking about that kind of thing now. Uh, but, but I, I am not sure exactly what to do there. Um, I could definitely, you know, maybe it's something Josh could work on, or maybe we could hire someone on contract to just go do all those things so it doesn't slow me down. I don't know. Um, like, what do you, do you think that we should try to do something smart there, or do you think we should just type in the Intel underscore MM underscore whatever? Or, I mean, it's just, when I go look at this, Like, okay, I, I look at this and I'm just like, wait, where are we? These, and I'm like, uh, I, this is more like, this is four times, five times, six times more instructions than are even in the compiler's bytecode representation right now. You know, like we run, we run entire programs with way less than this. And so it really is adding a lot just for one platform. Um, so I don't know. You think I need to have support for all the assembly? Oh, so, right. So the third option is inline assembly, right? So you're saying probably in inline assembly. Don't try to do a cross-platform thing. 
You just do inline assembly and you can write the assembly for different platforms. Maybe if someone wants to make a high level SIMD library, they can make one that, you know, compile time generates the strings for the assembly that you then feed into the inline assembler. Like you just need to write AVX when you need to write like, well, that's the, so, so part, that's what makes the cross platform thing hard to think about is like, it just isn't gonna, like the whole thing about SIMD programming is there's some weird case where you need to get data from this place to that way as efficiently as possible. Right. And yeah, there's going to be some tweaky AVX instruction that you can use on Intel that's going to be a lot better than something that you don't have anywhere else, right? So, um, yeah. GCC syntax for inline assembly. Well, there was the dude who wrote the higher level assembly thing that Casey liked. So we were talking to him a little bit and I was just like, look, right now I don't want more people working on the compiler, but now, now that we've gotten through some, some milestones, maybe that's changed. So I don't know. It's just a question of having that feedback. So I just want to have a way to say what I wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing, man. If we supported either inline assembly or all the intrinsics, either one of those, right? then somebody could make a higher level library that like does that little mini compilation, right? Or whatever from a higher level representation. And then if people use that and it actually works, we could look at building something like that into the compiler, I guess. But like doing a weird quasi high level thing when I don't know exactly what would work and what is best doesn't seem like a good idea, right? I would rather just do, do exactly the instructions um, and if that means we have to do them freaking three times, cause once on arm and once on Pico eight or whatever, uh, what raspberry Pi, wait, is raspberry Pi arm or what? Raspberry Pi CPU. It's a Broadcom. Yeah. So what about, uh, Commander X64 CPU. That's a custom CPU, right? That doesn't run ARM. It runs Motorola instructions, basically. No, no, not 64-bit computing. What's it called? What's this called? All right, everybody, I think we lost the internet there for a second. What is it called? Commander X16. All right. I think we have lost all chat. So when we do a port to the Commander X16, then That'll be other intrinsics, except it doesn't have intrinsics. Ha ha, trick question. Okay. So, so the problem that we have right now, I don't know if Casey's back on or if he has to reload. Um, the problem that we have right now is if we add if we do all this work to add AVX, literally the only person who will use it right now is Casey and he won't because he's not using this language. So literally zero people will use it. And that's, there's sort of a timing problem there. Um, so I'm not sure what to do about that exactly.
No one will use it if it isn't there. Yeah, well, that's that's great. How are there no beta people who want SIMD? Well, nobody's asked for it. People, as near as I can tell, everybody wants to do web things, and it's really sad, but that's what people want to do. So uh, they're going to, at least some of them are going to be like, this isn't the right language for web things. And I'll be like, yeah. <laughs> people look at what you give them. That is true. That is true. How did I pick these people? Look, I, look, it just happens. Maybe it's only the people who do web things are who I'm hearing the most from. I don't know, man. I think I need beta people who will use SIMD. Uh-huh. Do I know of source material where I can read about single inheritance systems like the one I talked about using Braid and the Witness? There's nothing to, like, it's not complicated. It's, it's just, it's just like you, calling it single inheritance systems is making it too complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's the thing, right? So if we do inline assembly, which I think could be interesting, I kind of wonder how to have it be a little bit modular. Like, I mean, maybe that's a fool's errand, but like, I just want to prevent somehow the complexity of all that stuff from contaminating the compiler. One good thing, if we do inline assembly, then we have to figure out how to get the compile time execution to call assembly, right? Which means we have to like thunk into runtime generated machine code, which I've been saying is probably the real right way to do all this the whole time. And then if we did that, that would cut down on the number of implementations of things that we have. We would only have to implement all the intrinsics twice instead of three times. Um, or, I mean, I actually don't know. Can I just give LLVM machine code? Is that a thing? Can I just say these instructions start here? Probably not. Like that would have to get figured out. Multi-threading and SIMD are the two most important things to get right. Well, I haven't done anything for either of those, so there you go. Is there a model of a CPU for the compiler? I, yeah, there's infinite registers in the compiler. You're looking for one example that can clear things up for you to reveal the lack of complexity. Just, I mean, just write some gameplay code and make it as simple as you can. That's how you learn how to do it. <laughs> it's really like reading, reading web sites about people's entity systems is wrong. Don't do that because it's all more complicated than you need. LLVM can take arbitrary strings of inline assembly. We don't want strings of inline assembly because we want our own format for the inline assembly. I mean, I guess we could just translate it, but that's going to be ass, but whatever, we could do it. So what's right? Just keep trying and hope you land on a good, correct implementation. Look, um, g games can get complicated to make sometimes, right? There's a lot of challenges. 
It's a lot of work, and if you do some of it wrong, it becomes a disaster. But the way your entities are set up is not the hard part, okay? If you are trying to focus on the way your entities are set up, you are misdirecting your effort, and that's going to make it harder, all right? Try to solve the problem that makes your game interesting. What is it about the gameplay that makes it interesting? What is it about the technology that makes it interesting that users could see? Focus on that. Solve those problems. That'll make it reality-based. See, the problem with everybody's website about how to set up your, uh, your entity system or whatever is it's all religious or superstitious, right? It's not grounded in the reality because most of these people haven't even shipped one game who are writing this stuff, all right? So get grounded in reality. See what's actually hard to do. See what's actually easy to do. And then do that. That's what you got to do. LVM expects it to be parsable by LVM parser. Yeah, so we could do a string to string translate, uh, which fortunately at least generalizes. Like, yeah, I, that's an annoying step to have to do, but, but I don't think it's that bad. Well, maybe that's the next step. Honestly. I'm going to write that down with a question mark. Well, like I said, zero of our users will use it yet, so whatever. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good to be trying to learn as much as you can. It's just the problem with trying to learn on the internet, fundamental problem of the internet, but especially with trying to learn to do games on the internet, is that most of the talking or typing or whatever is being done by people who are not sitting down programming, right? Because they're talking instead of programming. So your most of the advice is from people who don't have enough experience to give you good advice. And so it's very hard to learn good things. Um, and that's actually, even if that trade off of talking versus typing, typing into the program, even if that weren't so stark, you still have the, the bell curve thing where, you know, most of the people doing stuff are kind of landing in the middle in terms of quality and are kind of average, but you want to be good at the thing. But most advice is just going to be kind of average. And a lot of it will be bad. And only some of it will be good. Only a small percentage will be really good. So um, it's hard. It's hard to learn by reading stuff on the Internet. You can just give LLVM a string containing instruction bytes like byte 90, 90. Okay. So that, that could be the super low effort version. Yeah, exactly. Is there an experiment that could have validated this advice? Or, or more clearly, is there an experiment that could have invalidated the advice? And did they try that, right? Because that's what, for example, scientists have to do. That's what physicists do that keeps people taking them seriously is like they try to disprove their theory because they know that, that that's what somebody else will do. So they're like, I should do that. If I really want to know the truth, I should do that. So that's what people who post about their awesome system should do, <laughs> you know? Like, look, that's why we're making a shippable commercial game in this programming language. It's like, look, don't just try to sell your programming language to people because it's yours. Hit it with a serious job and see how it does. Try to break it by throwing a huge game at it 
and see if it doesn't break, right? That's how you do high quality work. I'm getting fat, just saying. It's hard to make judgments about something you can't play with yourself. Yeah, but I don't... Am I supposed to care about your judgment of my programming language right now when you don't use it? Like, why? You know what I mean? More room for tea and chocolate. My peppermint chocolate bars that I like are not for sale on Amazon anymore, I think because the chocolate factory's closed. So now I had to order a re-up of milk chocolates. I should have stocked up on peppermint chocolate bars. Okay. So, quarantine has officially gone too far. We do have chai, though. I think we're going to make another chai tonight. That's going to be a thing. Okay. Compiler doesn't warn you about shadowing a variable. This might have been fixed because, okay. So the deal is, when you do this kind of a thing, this is a statement type called compound declaration, and it gets broken behind the scenes into a series of simple declarations. And there were some problems with that, and I fixed them. And so uh, there might be more problems. Or, like, I don't remember when I fixed them and stuff. So we have to see, right? So here, clearly, he's defining these variables twice. That should be an error. But at the time when we were making the new declarations, I guess we were not correctly checking. So let's, let's even see what happens here. Uh, are, we, are we on debug or release right now? We're on debug. Let's make sure it's up to date. It is. Uh, did we check in? Is, we had, we had some, some discussions. OK, we're checked in. We're, we're all good. OK. so. It's broken. So the place where this happens is a function called check into sugar compound declaration. We can break there when we do a declaration on line 34 and see what happens. All right, check into sugar compound declaration. Oh, what? Don't make your editor scroll sideways. Like if I go somewhere in a file, I want to see the left-hand side of code. That's just how that works. Okay, um, uh, we're gonna say break, what line was it? Uh, line 34. All right. So, All right, um, so let's make sure it's the right one. Yes, uh, well, so we get the args. We check to make sure that everything is identifiers. We do some stuff about the number of return values. So this expansion that we build is the thing that um, actually contains all the declarations. 
So we make that expansion, we put the declarations in there, and then we link it back into the current namespace. And that link step I forget where the link step happens. So here we're making the declarations. And I don't actually know. where the linking happens. Oh, it's not really a link. We actually just, uh, we should be calling add to scope down here somewhere. Like, uh, add to, what's going on, man? Okay, we're just going to break, because I'm not sure where it happens. Add to scope. So we're going to break and check to add to scope, which I think we're not going to. Um, and add to scope is the thing that actually puts it in the hash table or the linear array if it's a small scope. So we are getting here, I think, because, um, I mean, you're able to look up the variables. So let's go. We're in checked add to scope. Make scope be lie. Oh, oh, this is not good. What? Like, how do we find this identifier if we don't call add to scope? This is the mystery. Um, that's weird. Oh, we do it, we do it in flatten. Okay, let's go back. I think it maybe hasn't happened yet and will happen. So we're going to, we're going to go back to those breakpoints and set them for line 34. sucks. Okay. I guess I don't trust this. So like, okay, we are, I guess, on line 34. Uh, entry identifier name. Other okay. All right. So this, we are actually calling checked add to scope from make scope be live. From, okay, I get you, I get you, from here. Okay, so make scope be live, like, takes the things in the sub scope and puts them up one. Okay, so why, what's going on here? Check for redeclaration. It's a small scope. It has two members in it. One is other junk, right? And one is other okay because of this first thing. Uh, and our new one, which one is it? Um, Other okay, so we're gonna 
skip this one for some reason. We're doing the other one first. Oh, because we went past it. Because that breakpoint was the right breakpoint the first time. Okay. So now these match. So entry old. So now we have an entry old and an entry new. So why are we ignoring them? Okay, register overload. <sighs> yeah, I forgot about this part. So here's the thing. When we add things to scopes, we don't know if they are procedures or not because it happens before type checking. So we have to register things as potential overloads and check them later. Now, the way that they get checked, I th we'd had a problem like this and I had fixed it. The way that they get checked is to check the overload head and make sure that everything there is a function. And if it's not a function, then you say, hey man, there's a redeclaration. For some reason, the thing that I added last week did not fix this problem in this case. So let's look. So here we're, we're making an overload list, all right? So this overload of and whatever, so entry old, Okay, the problem is, okay. So the place where we do this check is um, uh, uh, overload of, so this thing, this overload check hack, we do down here uh, for imperative scopes. And where is that? Oh, we do it twice. We do it once when we're inserting a using. Okay, I see what's going on. Um, entry new. Yeah. I don't know what to do, <laughs> except make it even more of a hack. So, normally the place where we check this now is when the declaration gets inferred. The problem is the overload head already got inferred because it's an imperative scope. So uh, although actually, No, because this should fire when the second declaration goes, because that one's not inferred. The problem is uh, the problem is it doesn't have an import link. Because remember when I said we link the names, we don't actually link the names. We just make them live. So this is sort of the error, maybe. Um, let me read what this comment is. Oh, it's just, it's just about the fact that we don't queue things that have import links. Okay. I think, oh my God, Emacs was so slow right there. Jesus. Um, I think it's, uh, I mean, I don't see why we don't just do that. This might break something though. And if it breaks something, then I want to comment why we did this, because right now I don't understand why we did that. 
um, well, why is overload check hack? Does it expect things? It expects it to be inferred. Okay, that's what, okay. Um. So the thing is, if you have an import link, it's linking to something that is already inferred. This declaration is not, all right? So we're gonna do this down here. I don't like it when you start getting into squirrely ifs like this, but the first step, first step is to solve the problem. Overload, check, hack, deckle, okay. Okay, there we go. Now the question is, did we break everything else in the universe? Wait, did we, okay, we, we didn't try compiling the game. Okay, now we're like super deep in a different problem, everybody. Remember when I made that parsing change and then said, ba bing bing, I didn't go back and test everything. And now that is broken. because I didn't think of everything. So now we have to fix that too. Good thing it's Sunday. We're not breaking the build for anyone. Let's make that X64. I added a report parser, but removed the return null. Um, that would not be good, uh, but that also wouldn't be this problem. You are right. I didn't put the return null. That was a mistake. Um, but we shouldn't be getting here anyway for a valid program. So the problem is... Uh, Wait, does this just not compile? Like why? Is this just wrong? This is actually wrong code. This was invalid, it's just we never detected it correctly. So now we're detecting something correctly. Okay, this is like, this is just not a thing that you can do, bro. That is a thing that you can do. Yeah, so I think Ignacio did that when he was doing the direct X and you know, the language syntax and semantics are not documented anywhere. So he tried that and it worked and he was like, cool. Um, and it did, it actually does the correct thing, but it's not legal. So, all right, that's fine. We have fixed that. Does the game run? Okay. So we used to return null about this return null comment. Um, we used to, wherever that error was here, 
this used to be just a return null, and then we put the error in, or, and I accidentally deleted the return null at that time. And so now we're putting it back. Okay, so the game compiles. Let's see if test compile and debug build. And while that's happening, we'll also do release build because building debug build is slow. While we are running the debug build tests, it takes a year. Does anyone have on topic questions about what we are doing and what the meaning of any of this is? Okay, that's great. So as soon as this passes, we'll run release tests and then we will check in both of these fixes. Unless something fails. Bam, how many lines left do we have of this? 120. Good. And one of them is big. So questions. Compiler engineering is super cool. Yeah, it's fun sometimes. Um, it'll drive you nuts if your language is ambitious, though. I'll tell you that. I know somebody has questions. How well am I going to support hot reloading? I don't know. We don't right now. I mean, we just support compilation going real fast. So we might do hot reloading at some point. Um, it's probably not that hard to support at the compiler level. Will the tool chain come with a automatic formatter? No. You're assuming there is such thing as a tool chain. No, there is not. I hate tools. Tools can go jump off a cliff. Tools, the fact that there are all these tools is part of the why nobody gets any work done. Seriously. You should use as few tools as you can. Hot reloading is all about keeping the data valid across compiles. I don't think I would do anything about data remapping. That's not, that requires you to buy into too much. I would just do code hot reloading, honestly. Okay. Oh, we've got a no check-in and um, we didn't put it in the change log. Um, fixed uh, failure to detect redeclared identifiers in com generated by comma separated declarations. Look at all the things. We're not even done. Look at all the things. Okay, um, what's our no check-in? It's 
probably explain something. Yes, uh, 9973. I don't like having all these calls to overload check pack. The issue here is overload check pack wants to know the inferred type of a declaration. So for vanilla declarations, we can't do it until here. Um, we have a check on entry that applies when decal import link. Uh, is that one redundant with this now and can it be removed? I don't want to experiment with that until we have tests for compilation failures as opposed to the current scheme of tests just for compilation success. Um, And we have a thorough uh, suite of tests for undeclared identifiers generated via using compound decals other inserters. OK, there we go. That is good enough for now. What I'm basically saying is I kind of want to remove that other call but I'm not sure, and it's not going to do any harm having both there, really. It's just a tad slower. Um, not really slower enough for anyone to ever notice. OK. Boom. I should have recompiled. Oh, I did. You assume that's the reason why you use a plain Emacs, keep it as simple as possible. Sort of. It's also just there's switching time involved in switching editors, right? So if I want to pay that switching cost, I want to know that the new editor is good. And most modern editors that I have seen are built around what I think is a bad way to edit things. They're built around like popping up crap in your face all the time so that you can do completions. I think all that stuff is bad. I don't want any of that. So... Um, you know, if if there's an editor that seems like it has a good long term story of why I would want to use it, uh, and it's not built around a bad theory about how to edit, then I might try that. Otherwise, long term, I would write my own editor. You know, um, again, a text editor is not that hard these days. Um, so whatevs. Um, Okay, but of course I'm way too busy to make a text editor right now, so that is what it is. Okay, this shows a circular dependencies error. Let's see if it still does or if I fixed that because we did fix some other things over the past couple days. I feel like it's still going to make an error, but let's see. Ha ha, we fixed it. We fixed it, bro, bam, gone, 80 lines left, import inside macro. This is one of the ones that we deferred um, for a while. Let's see what happens. We want this to work. I think it's just that it's going to... Oh, I don't know. Undeclared identifier print. What if I put this here? Does that work? Yes. So it is a problem with it being in a macro in some way. Oh, 
works too. Okay. Well. You thought that was the Emacs ethos. You just keep customizing it more and more and then you die. The problem with Emacs is it is written in a very, the, the customization is all in bad Lisp dialects. I don't want to touch Lisp ever. It's needlessly slow, as you can see, by the way. I mean, it's hard for you to tell exactly how slow Emacs feels. It feels very slow, running on a modern, very, very, very fast computer. Um, and I don't want it like write in a type-free bullcrap language that's very error prone, that people should have been smart enough and noticed this sometime decades ago if they weren't ideologically captured by the idea that Lisp is super powerful in some way. It's not. So the reason, and so my Emacs config kind of sucks these days and it's because I, I just refuse to touch the Elisp, you know. And just if you try to figure out how to do basic stuff, it's really convoluted. Like it's not even only in Lisp, but like the way you add hooks to things is this weird data driven way where you put a weird list in a weird format somewhere. It's not like a regular sane API where you just call a function to register a thing, which would be far superior to what it does. Like just let me call a function to register a thing and we're good. And it's not like that. And every single time I have to go figure out what the hell is this? What does expand do? It's a macro. It's a macro. Okay. How do you tag things for the meta program? Um, well, you can do the you can do the little notes on your things. Okay. If I remove this expand, then it all works, right? Okay. So let's put it back where up. Oh, I'm in the wrong window. Don't be in the wrong window. You know what happens if you're in the wrong window. Okay. Um, so something funny is happening with the import. Or it's just not happening. Like maybe maybe when we make this scope live, the import is not happening. That's possible. I think that's more likely. I think that's probably what's happening. It's not that the import is going to the wrong namespace or something. Oh, um, we have a way to say, is it import debug? Yeah, okay, we could do this. So watch this, if I put this here, then it'll tell me what is happening. We did the using, like this just basically means, look, we fired this off. This using means that we're gonna do everything in that scope. Okay, if I put this here, does that happen or not? It doesn't ever, we just get undeclared identifiers. So, it is not happening. Um, and the reason it's not happening is because when we do make scope be live, we're not handling imports. And the reason that for Okay, my question is, when 
If it's here, when does it happen? Like, when do we do this? Whoops, are we, I'm not doing the wrong program. We're doing Sokoban. We don't want to do Sokoban right now. Okay. So we're doing inferred types. This guy got queued. God, that's so slow. Okay, this using got created for this thing. Um, let's find out where. We're not gonna recompile for this because hopefully it's short. It's cold in here, guys. What's going on? Yeah, it's not importing into the scope of the macro. That was a theory that I had, but it is not. Okay, so handle bear import, add directive import in um, infer, which means this import got flattened in. Okay, do we not get here? when it's in the macro. I feel like we must get there if it's in the macro. Mm. Okay, well, we don't want this right now. because It's not gonna be the same. Okay, we do get here. That's good. So maybe the using gets created inside the macro or we decline to create it. Let's see. So we're going to handle bare import. Wait, I tried to step into that and it didn't. Oh, import is not bare. But it was before. So is bare is supposed to mean whether it's like this or not. For some reason, that's false. That I don't understand. I just want to see, does this change based on where it is? So if I put it here, it says bear, okay? If I put it here, I'm sure it says bear. This is a weird bug, but if I put it in the macro, it's not? What are you talking about, bro? Okay, unexpected.
Okay. Pfft. Yeah. Um. Okay, this is a weirdo. Parse directive Im uh, import. Let's search for this. Okay, so here's where we are parsing the thing. It's where you would expect we're parsing a body of a procedure. Now, where is this thing that sets is bare? That is, if not handled, way down in parse one statement. Okay, so I mean we're right there. Okay, let's so make sure we didn't do something weird. Expression type is import. Okay. We use semicolons every day. Um, I mean, we're setting is bare on it. Oh, guys. This is getting copied later because of the thing that I haven't changed yet. And is bear got added and I neglected to copy that. See, you have to, okay, you know, you know what time it is. Well, let's make sure this is correct. And then we'll have educational session. All right. Um, so the deal is we're supposed to copy this whenever we copy this thing, and I didn't do that. Okay, now you'll note, so first, I'm just gonna make sure, like, since this is wrong, are there other fields here maybe? Okay, we do import flags, we do is bare, we should copy debug, honestly. Um, the rest of this stuff is not things we should copy. Okay. Now, first you'll note, let's make sure it works before we jump to conclusions. Um, that's the wrong compiler. There we go. It works. That was really stupid. Whenever things are parser bugs, or that's not really a parser bug, but if it's not a type checking or out of order compilation bug, I'm very happy because it's easy to fix. All right, so um, change log fixed import not working inside macros. Bam. So Here's the thing about debugging, right? The more time you spend debugging, the less time you're programming. You want to spend as little time debugging as possible. So you'll note, I was stepping through the program. I didn't know what was going on, but once I started to see what was going on and what a weird bug it was, I started thinking, I didn't keep stepping through the program in different ways to try to watch for the place where the mistake happens. Because that, this compiler is complicated, right? Instead, I was like, okay, I see, wait, it's getting set. So how is it unset way later? Oh, I bet, because I have experience with this compiler, I bet the copier is in play and we copy this thing, which we do when we instantiate a macro, right? So I jumped to conclusions and then I went and tested those conclusions. And you have to do, to debug effectively, you want to do that as much as possible. I mean, you don't want to jump to wrong conclusions. And I do that sometimes. Uh, 
you, so that's why you test to see if your conclusion is is really right. So that's why that's why that's why we always need to learn. Like that guy that invented the pet rock? You see, that's what you have to do. You have to use your mind and come up with some really great idea like that, and you can make millions, never have to work again. You think the pet rock was a really great idea? Sure it was. The guy made a million dollars. You know, I had an idea like that once, a long time ago. Really, what was it, Tom? Well, all right. It was a jump to conclusions mat. You see, it would be this mat that you would put on the floor and would have different conclusions written on it that you could jump to. That is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life, Tom. Yes, yes, it's horrible, this idea. So jumping to conclusions is important. You know, we need a jump to conclusions emote. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we need a jump to conclusions emote. That's going to be the next emote. Okay. We jumped to conclusions. All right. This one So let's make this a different operator because overloading operator equal is a little weird, but um, Why does it think Why does it think there are no Why does it think those don't match? None of the possible overloads matches the required procedure type. I mean, it sure looks like it should match, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Okay. It really, it, re it really looks like it's the first one. All right, so. Let's look at this. Here are the overloads. Let's get rid of this breakpoint. Here are the overloads. Oh, um, I thought this was going to go redo the type check. So we actually need this. 
Okay. So this is what is not working. There's no switchable expression given. Anyway, uh, ident arrow s is this. So we're going to rerun here. Close. So we have overloads. Overloads are happening. Um, it's the first one. Right, so let's double check. Uh, entry is line 11 of this file, line 11. Yep, it's that one. Okay, so why do we think it doesn't match? So check that types match is a gigantor procedure that does things. Let me just, yeah, there's not, uh, okay. So there'll be a, a place down here where we're like, are they both procedures? Whoa, what? That should have been, okay, hold on. Hold your horses. Wanted. Okay. Um, these flags look fishy. Is one of these flags the we only want the type flag, which would be fine. Uh, Lambda flags. So uh, 20040, uh, 2, wait, that's not, we want def and flags. Wouldn't it be great if it would just like print us the flags? Uh, 2, we only want the function type. That might be what's screwing us up, is lambda. Okay. Um, because this might be like, Oh, do you mean that it's actually a lambda and not a type? So I might have used the wrong thing here. Okay, uh, given this should have the four O as well. Eight oh eight no. Okay, this is the problem actually. What the hell? Oh, this is. We're passing overload set. No. What is this type? What is flag eight? Type leaf. Which type leaf is it? Void. Really? Type def void. So it thinks that this procedure is void for the purposes of this type check, that does not sound correct to me. Why does it think that? I don't know. Why is the double equal highlighted? Look, man, it is what it is. Um, Okay. Why is it void? All right, so we have a thing to think about. Is it up here or does it get substituted later for some reason? Inferred type. That's not void.
although it is something weird. Type leaf again, but with a four. Overload set, okay. That makes sense though. Overload set, that makes sense. Um, so here, here we're doing the matching against an overload set. Okay, so like, Entry given is get inferred type. So entry is vo what? That doesn't make any sense. Why is the type of this thing set to void? It's an operator double equal function. Well, we can, we can certainly figure this out. It might be because I'm disallowing, let me just try an experiment. Let's try that. See, same thing. So it's it's not something weird happening with equal. Okay. So let's look at entry a bit more. Oh, I know what it is. We were just looking at the line that caused this problem. So entry is an import link. And we were setting the type to void for some reason. Okay. This is kind of a crazy mess. Um, things, things get confusing sometimes. X86 processors need to jump to conclusion instruction. What would it do? I mean, isn't the return instruction kind of jump to conclusion? Maybe it would just scan forward to the nearest return instruction and jump to it. Okay, so what is happening here is we have some wacky rules that usually apply for like how to get the type of something in the face of overloads and whatever. And like, honestly, we're gonna change the way all this is stored later so that this won't be as wacky as it is. The thing is that back here, okay, let's try this. I think this will solve it, and if so, we will comment it.
There we go. Undeclared identifier print because I was stupid and didn't do this. Okay. So I will comment this. Uh, this is definitely a cleanup. Um, we do get final declaration here because if there is an intermediate uh, overload set get inferred type gives us a weird answer that we do not like. This is not great, but it should get naturally solved when we do the refactor where we store the inferred types separately from ASC nodes. May 2020. Okay, great. So now we're going to do our standard thing where we make sure everything works. Okay, that one. That was our last long code snippet, I think. Okay, the game compiles. Let's go back to our program here. That compiles. The game runs. Uh, the tests. Let's do the tests. You know how much we like tests. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's go to the change log. Um, Okay. Okay, so we have these two. I kind of want to take a brain break for a few minutes, so let's just talk for a few minutes about the life. And then I can start looking at these. We have a less scary one and a more scary one. What's going on, people? How is life, people? You know, I think all this means we ship a new beta tomorrow. Maybe we'll do some documenting in the morning and ship it. How do I enjoy a vacation by myself? You've been single for a while and haven't bothered to take one for that reason. Um, okay, here's the thing. You got to be able to enjoy things by yourself. <laughs> I don't know what else to say besides that. I mean, if something isn't interesting fundamentally, like you're not interested in seeing what a place is like or how things are in a particular part of the world, then why is it interesting if there's someone else there? You know, maybe... If you're just interested in the other person, then why do you need the vacation as an excuse? Like, that's weird, right? It doesn't make sense. You just graduated college yesterday. This is, well, congratulations. You're free. You're free. Do I have physics books to refresh my memory before implementing stuff to the engine? I don't do physics programming basically ever. You don't need physics books for general game programming.
hey, I tried to click on this Twitter link and Twitter said something went wrong and I refreshed, something went wrong. I don't think this tweet that you just linked me exists. Oh, I've been blocked. Why are you linking me to a tweet from someone who blocked me? Here's a terrible idea. Allow any binary function t, t to t to serve as a compound assignment operator. Um, I don't, we already do that. We already do that. So why, once again, Once again, this is something we've been doing for like four or five years, three years. Why not make these compiler bugs extra test cases to the compiler? Um, in some cases, that might be a thing to do. Uh, that one especially, maybe we should, honestly. You like the example node arrow equal next. I mean, that's a little too cryptic for me, but. Oh, he's saying X equals max X comma Y to be the same as X max equals Y. Yeah, I don't think that's worth it. <laughs> How many people are actually working on the compiler right now? Um, not that many people, like two. What's the hardest part of the compiler? Um, the nonlinear compilation. Do I use Vim keybinds in VS Code? Well, I don't use VS Code, so no. What do you need to learn in order to write a compiler? Um, it's just regular programming. You could read some books about how to write compilers, but none of them are that good. But you could just read those and then just start trying your ideas, you know? Really, the, the thing you need is just you need to be good at programming to do a good job. And you get good at programming by practicing. So there's nothing, there's nothing like cryptic or scary about it. How often do I meditate? Uh, erratically, not as much as I should and erratically. OK, we're going to make a test case out of this. Uh, uh, we're going to put this in MISC. Okay, so now we can't run this individually because of the way the tests program is structured right now that we're going to change eventually. Um, but there we go. My main and overload main are both being called right there, and they both pass. So yes, that is now in the test suite. It's easy to add things to the test suite, so we should do it sometimes when it makes sense for sure. If you add too many things to the test suite, like if you spend most of your time testing things that are never going to go wrong, that's a little bit bad. Um, but yeah, add a test to the test suite. Um, oh, uh, fix 
fix a bug with overload resolution. Ba bam. Okay, we're I'm still in chatty mood. Do I read assembly on occasion? Yeah, I do. I mean, if you're making a compiler, sometimes you're going to generate the wrong assembly instructions, and then you, you need to be able to know what those are, and you need to be able to step through a program in assembly to see what's wrong. We did that, I think, even yesterday or the day before. I think it was yesterday. It was this week, for sure. We did that. Um, and also, in the past couple days, we did some generation of machine code. So that's the opposite of reading assembly. You have to, you have to create the correct bytes that the CPU will interpret in the appropriate way. How hard would it be to write an init scope attribute that would assert that all fields in a struct are assigned to in a scope? Um, I think that that would be mostly easy. The problem is, the problem is the standard thing in compilers about what do you count as assigned, right? If you pass a pointer to one of those members to some function somewhere, does that count as assigned? Maybe, maybe the function filled in the pointer, maybe it didn't, right? And then you can do arbitrary levels of analysis to try to figure that out. But if you mean, if you mean very basic dumb assignment, then yeah, it's probably, probably pretty easy. Um, the thing you have to remember is that structs in this language have constant value initializers. So it's not like C where your struct is uninitialized anyway. So that would be a weird thing to do because usually you're able to make a struct whose default state is what you want or pretty close to what you want. And you wouldn't want people to have to assign everything. Like that's part of what makes this language a little bit higher level is people don't have to assign everything. Have I played Dota? I've played Dota 2 a little bit for like, I played four or five hours of Dota 2. Do I think this would be a good language to learn game development from? I mean, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Like if you want to do games in this language and you want to learn how to do them, that's great. I think it'll be good for that, yes. but. But if you want to learn to make games, the number one th thing is to make games. If you're not making games in any language, you're not learning. So like you don't have access to this programming language right now, probably. <laughs> so why would you wait until you do to start learning how to make games? Why don't you just start in something else? Like, yes, if you wanted to switch to this later, you'd have to move your code over, but that's a learning experience also. Play more Dota. I just don't like it. Is there a performance hit by parsing a variable by the x colon equals 32 syntax as they do in Rust x equals 32? One guy who was criticizing my language argued that the forward lookup adds overhead. Well, first of all, we compile like 27,000 times faster than Rust. That's not an actual number, but so why, what? And secondly, um, I don't understand what he means by forward lookup. That whoever was, oh, he means that the let keyword tells you that it's a declaration. Yeah, this guy doesn't fucking know anything about fast code if he thinks that. Sorry, it's, it is what it is. The forward lookup adds overhead, give me a break. Learn to program, dude. No, I don't wanna be that mean, but like, um, yeah, that is, that is so in the noise on performance, it literally doesn't matter literally doesn't matter. Um, and like, I don't even think that that statement makes sense. Cause like, okay, for declaration, I guess you know it's a declaration if you see a let, 
but like, what about all the other things in your language? Like how, like what? It does, whoever said this it doesn't, yeah, it's just. It's nonsense. This is what I mean by most of the information on the internet being bad. So do you use a specific algorithm for type inference? Is it Hindley Milner? No. Uh, I mean, sort of, we just do the obvious. Okay. So first of all, Hindley Milner is kind of the obvious thing. I'm not sure why it even has a name. Hindley Milner is the standard computer algorithm thing of keep iterating a process until there are no more changes. Like that's all Hindley Milner is. It's applying that idea to types. Um, maybe, maybe that was a seemingly big insight back when it was done originally, which was a long time ago. So I don't have context on that, but um, you know, that's what that is. Don't let the fancy maths fool you. Um, that's all it's doing. So the question is, do we do that exactly? And the answer is no. And the reason is we don't want type inference to move unbounded in all directions throughout your programming language, because that is what makes your language slow. It makes it tremendously more slow than like an if statement per declaration or whatever. Right? So, um, So the, the type inference in this language is built very specifically to be fast. Um, it, it doesn't move in all directions. Because of that, there are a couple of things that we don't do. So for example, uh, we don't infer the return types of procedures from the bodies of the procedures. Um, I just don't think that's very helpful. And not having that kind of thing makes us a lot faster. Uh, yeah. We actually explained it at one point. There's, again, I mean, there's a billion videos on YouTube, right? But we did one where I talked through what, what the system was. It's in one of the demos. A lot of the times you get something off of a free list and the values you want the members to be are not the defaults. You have this problem all the time. Okay, if that happens in this language, uh, you can call the initializer of the struct so, um, you know, we don't have constructors, but we have initializers. And an initializer is a little bit conceptually like a constructor, except it's only data, right? So it can't do, um, it's representable as a mem copy, for example, from static data. That's not necessarily how it's implemented, but it's representable that way. And so you know it's not going to go off and run arbitrary code or need global state to be a particular way or anything like that. Um, so you can just call the initializer of that type on the memory. Am I still looking for a name for the programming discussions I host on Twitch? Sure. We haven't done one in a little bit, but yeah. Could you add a command that lists all other commands that don't have a help string? Yeah, I'm just not sure what we would use that for. Rust is only compile time slow. Yeah, but, but that's what we were talking about. Like the difference of whether the word let is there or not doesn't matter at runtime. The only possible time that that could matter is at compile time and it doesn't matter. So the guy works at IBM. Well, you know, great. Add two plus two, assign y equals five, call f of four, gotta let the compiler know. I know, I mean, it's not quite fair because I haven't seen the guy's actual criticism, but it doesn't sound like a good criticism to me. <laughs> um, do we have support for AVX 512? We were talking about that during the stream earlier. Um, currently we do not. Uh, we might do it at some point. It's just um, none of our testers is using it that right now. Um, I do not have a legitimate use for it right now. And um, we would have to build out probably inline assembly, but maybe it's time to do that.
Do I feel like working on struct literals yet? Yeah, maybe pretty soon. I was thinking just yesterday or today or sometime that that might be, because we're at the point where we're starting to do little new features. And that, that is one of the new features that certainly people would use a lot that is not in there. Ever think about writing your own OS? Sometimes. Sometimes. Are there dependency systems? Are there other systems you think could be simplified, removed? Um, so the copier, which was the source of one of these bugs today, if you were watching, um, that thing is invoked uh, when you do macros and when you polymorph and stuff. And I would like to remove that. Um, not just to remove that, but because the resulting structure would be better for multi-threading. Um, so that's the only main thing that I would like to remove right now. Is there an updated feature roadmap? No, and I'm not going to post one because, again, uh, my attitude towards open sharing of information like that has changed based on the way people have treated the information that I have shared. What about 0 equals 5 equals for arrays? Um, we could think about that. I just don't see, like by the time you're doing that, I don't know, we'll think about, it. there's several different ways you could think of doing that. It seems like a lot of syntax for very little use because that's only gonna apply when you have an array that you want to be mostly zero or maybe there can be a thing that says default value, but that's not really what happens. Like usually when you have an array, it's full of stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the last thing I want is people bothering me about I didn't do things in exactly the order I set on the roadmap or whatever too. That's like, if I have less of internet people pestering me, that is better way better. Because of course, the next thing on the roadmap is to put the word let in so that the parser knows that it's a declaration. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe if I use the word var instead of let, it'll go even faster than let. What do you think? Maybe if I use single character L instead of the word let, that'll be faster because the keyword is shorter. What do you guys think about that? Like which characters, okay. We need to pick a single character that has only one ASCII bit set because that will use the minimum amount of electricity. You know, like Okay.
Is Monday next beta? Um, I, yeah, I think I ship the next beta tomorrow. Okay. Like what? Like this language compiles faster than most other people's languages. Like Fortran's probably faster. If somebody wrote a good Fortran compiler today, which there probably aren't any. Like why would you have the criticism that it's slow because of a grammar feature when empirically it's very fast? I, I don't even understand. I don't even understand. Does he think I'm faking the compilation speed? Does he think I'm pretend? Basically, the point of leading keyword let is to eliminate the need for look ahead, which speeds up parsing and removes ambiguity. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. The reason it doesn't make sense is because um, like gra grammars are complicated. There are a lot of different types of things in your language, right? And so first of all, I mean, declarations are not that uncommon, right? But they shouldn't be like, you have to at least use things more than you declare them. Otherwise, you're declaring things that never get used, right? So declarations are fewer than half of your statements by definition. A. Secondly, um, Secondly, it's assuming that things are being done in a look ahead way, which honestly, I don't even remember, but I don't think we are. I don't think we're doing look ahead that way by default. Like if you're going to parse a statement, you need to read. If you know it's a statement, you need to read at least two tokens anyway. I mean, this is the thing. This is the weird thing. Like. The part that's maybe slow is like generating the token, like looking at looking at the text characters, right? Deciding what it is. Oh, this is a single character token. This is a double character token. This is a keyword. This is which keyword it is, right? Um, that's still super fast compared to most things a compiler does. Uh, but if you were to do that repeatedly, I could see that being slow. But like you don't ever do that. Like when you do a parser, once once a once a token is uh, generated, you want fast access to it again without having to regenerate it. Like, I'm sure just about every modern parser does that. So I'm not sure what that complaint is exactly. Um, so we're talking about if there is an actual complaint, we're talking about things on the order of a single if statement on data that's in cache which again, these CPUs do five ops per cycle. So you're talking about a fifth of a cycle on one core of a difference on something that is less than half of your statements. Um, maximum. And what about all your other statements? Like, are you applying this are, are you applying the save a fifth of a cycle on one core to every single statement in your grammar? Um, and what does that turn your grammar into? Like, shouldn't you rather optimize for what is actually usable for people? And I'm not even sure that it actually costs a fifth of a cycle on one core. I'm just saying that's kind of the maximum, right? And actually, in our case, we probably save that because he's parsing this keyword let. 
That's several characters, bro. You have to do work to do that. A colon is faster. So like, I, it does. none of this makes any sense. Like it might make sense if you were assuming some very heavy shift reduce parser mechanism like under the hood that like has to do a bunch of extra work for some reason, do a look ahead, but that's not how it is. It's very fast. Why am I feeding the trolls? Well, I mean, it's just a funny, it's a funny criticism and we're using it to actually talk about compilers a little bit, so it's useful, right? We're using it to talk about what is fast and what is slow and how compilers work. And so, you know, there's a bit of, Like look ahead is so fast anyway. And I'm not even sure we need extra look ahead here. I don't remember, but it's so fast. It doesn't matter. It probably makes sense in Rust because you can bind to arbitrary expressions. Yeah, I don't know. You can also <laughs> remove sleep calls to make your code go faster. Pro tip, remove the sleep calls. Any games today? Maybe later. We're still going to do some more work here. How are we doing at finding programmers? We did hire one person recently, a couple months ago, and um, we're sort of, it's a little high, harder to hire people during coronavirus time, so we're being a little slower about it. But we have some stuff in our inbox about potential programmers. How many packages are currently integrated into the language core? I don't understand the question. What is the language core? Okay. Is it unpleasant at all to work in the same place I cook? I wouldn't know because I don't cook. Um, <laughs> to speak of, okay, let us, okay, we can go to this, make a better error message for that. Cause that is not valid. Your opinion is not valid. Okay. We use semicolons every day. Well, I'm just going to break at that, and then we're just going to look at what the code looks like and see what we can do. Uh, why am I still on Twitter? Okay, so... Semicolon expected. Uh, 
So this is like, it thinks, it, it just managed to parse an identifier. OK. So this is weird because we're not, the thing that's weird here is we're not reporting like a lexical range. Oh, because we're setting the, why are we doing that? Hold on, let's set a breakpoint here. And get the T. I mean, the whole funny thing about that complaint is, or about that quote criticism is like parsing. So this language compiles really fast compared to other languages. Parsing is a small percentage of even our compile time. Like, I think it's like 5% or something like that. So like, you know, this compiler compiles our game in well under a second and 5% of that is parsing. 100,000 lines of code. Like what? I don't even know. I don't even know what planet you come from to think that there's a problem. <sighs> All right. We use semicolons every day. What will happen if I write semicolon after semicolon? We should just output the correct YouTube video for this when people use semicolons. Okay. Um, so why do we need to do this anymore? What's in this token? Like, let's, I don't know why I did that. So I'm just going to say, I don't know why I did this. Uh, if this needs to be reinstated next time, write a comment explaining why. This was probably back when I was like first. So this whole like lexical range per token we didn't used to have. It used to just be, um, okay. So now at least we're highlighting the int. So we, we didn't used to have the full range and that might've been screwing things up in some way, but, but now I think we, yeah, I don't know. Okay, semicolon expected after expression. Um, so let's get, let's get smart assy about it. Um, okay. So, uh, if next is lexer dot peak next token. Okay. So this stuff that we were talking, okay. When I say get last token and peak next token, right? These are really fast things. They're inline. They just look in this token array to see if something's there. If it's not there, then we go generate it. All right. Um, but you can just peak the token a lot and it's fast. It just gives you a pointer to a token that the lexer has stored. It doesn't like regenerate anything, which is why, yeah, like, it's fine. Okay, everyone, welcome to grammar class. 
Um, and again, this is not like some rocket science. Like I'm sure most parsers these days do this. So I don't even understand the objection. Like what? Okay. Uh, okay. So if, if, uh, token arrow type is token ident and uh, next type is token ident else. So this is like a generic thing that like, well, uh, we, we don't know what this was. Should we come up with a an error message here that is more helpful in the general case. Yes, we should. But here we say for now, we say, okay, everyone, welcome to grammar class. And uh, we're going to rewrite that in a second, but I just want to make sure that that works. Um, oh yeah. Uh, wait, what are these different types? <sighs> what am I doing? What? Wait, what? Oh, get last token. Okay, there's so many things. Okay, it's it is called type. So wait. Hold on. What what is happening? I think one of these is by value. Okay. Get last value is like, or get last token. I, I did some crazy stuff in the API that I shouldn't have done. That's what happened. Okay. There we go. Okay, everyone, welcome to grammar class. But if it's something else like uh, this, now we get the old thing. Okay. So instead of, okay, everyone, welcome to grammar class, we're going to say, um, parse error. This looks like a C style declaration to identifiers in a row. Um, maybe it's Maybe it's a mistake of habit. I don't know. Dumb error message, but there we go. Oh, that's, I mean, what else could we say? We could, oh geez. Hopefully everyone's still there. I just accidentally hit control alt windows, something bad. Oh my God. Everything is, uh, stop. No, I don't want there. Okay, it closed the other windows, all of them. Do they come back later if I build? Yes, okay, great. Um, <laughs> aren't I glad I could drag and drop windows? It's so weird because making a like controllable version of that is maybe not that hard, but okay. Error colon parse error is not a good phrase. Error, uh, unable 
to parse an expression here. Maybe it's a mistake of habit. If you want, to declare a variable try percent s colon percent s semicolon right comma um, what is it called uh, name token dot name name uh, uh, next name name okay the colon before the thing is not that great but we'll do this let's put some spaces all right I don't know How about a new line? See, the problem with the new line is now, now then we have this and then that. Dude, I, I don't know. We should put it in a color, honestly. But we don't have markup for colors in our error messages right now. Just put quotes around it. We're putting quotes around it. Okay. That's an error message for noobs. Let's make sure we didn't break anything. Now, of course, the problem is that work that we just did, it was not very much, but, but as soon as we add something to the grammar where it is legal in some cases to have two declarations in a row, we won't hit that code path anymore. Uh, so, it is what it is, and we might do that at some point. Yeah, who knows? Okay. Um, we use semicolons every day. Okay, I oversteeped my apple cinnamon spice tea. Usually, so when I steep Bengal spice, I don't have to worry about that because it just keeps getting better. But, um, yeah, I missed the warning. Um, you know, this is not Bengal spice and it gets nasty if it's too steep. So we got to dump it. F Look at all the things. Look at the things, dude. Okay. 
Look at how many semicolons we use every day. All right, so. Um, improved error message for general parse error. Okay. So this is a doozy right here. I mean, maybe it'll be not that bad, but um, I mean, it, it certainly should be done. It certainly should be done. We'll give it a try. We don't even have to undo this test case first because step one is just changing stuff around and making sure the compiler still works for current code. Okay, after our bad experience with cinnamon apple spice, we are back to sleepy time mint. Might put us to sleep, who knows. Have you considered allowing variable declaration inside if while condition? Um, I mean, I don't totally like that style. So the thing is the while condition version of it, uh, and also the, you know, the while and for loop version, um, you don't do while and for loops that much in this language or, or not the integer based for loops, right? You usually do the for loops, uh, where you iterate over an array or something. And in that case, uh, well, actually even for numeric for loops, you declare the iterator there, right? So the question is just while loops and um, and if statements. And for while loops by themselves, eh, like I almost never use them. The Usually if I do use them, it's like a while one anyway, and I break out. So like the utility of having that is not really that good. So the question is then, is it useful for if statements? If it is useful for if statements, then you might as well do it for while loops also, right? Just for consistency. Um, and, you know, I found myself wanting to do it once or twice for if statements. Um, so I could see maybe doing that. It just doesn't feel like a high priority, but I could see doing it. Yeah. While one is still a thing, not four, blah. Um, no, I mean, four kind of expects you to give it the arguments of what to do. We could make four with braces work, but like, Yeah, it's just that's a very minor syntactic thing about which of those. What do I think about local functions? We've had those since 2014, bro. I think, or 2015, a long time. 
A long time. We've had those since before half the Twitch chat was born. Why? You end up using four semicolon semicolon. Yeah, whatever. I, it's just not that important. It's just not that important. I didn't answer the question. What? God. Oh my God. Okay. Let's look at this. So the deal is we are currently making modified gen lambda in the parser and that is not the right place to do it. This part. So first, let's just factor it out into its own function, which seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, make gen lambda modify or interp. We're going to need the modify, and we're going to need um, the. Do we actually look at the? How do we get? Where is the thing where we fill the arguments block? Hold on, let's. I want to look for that as well. Does that happen later? So this is all just what we're... what we're looking at, right? So... here is where we fill it out, and that's in the parent lambda Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the gen lambda here, still in the parser. But we're going to move the call. Okay, first thing we're going to do is factor out the call. Second, we're going to call it here instead of where it is being called, right? Um, and then third, we're going to try to move this whole thing. And we're going to do that step by step because what, what we're doing is kind of precarious. So we're going to say make gen lambda. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, that's fine. Um, we need to parse the, okay, the reason we were doing this before. You know what? Mm. I have the option of leaving this here and just moving the other part as well. There are many ways we could do this. The reason why I'm creating this here is because we want to parse into the block of this thing. But
we could easily just store that as a spare block on the directive. Let's even, let's even do this. We're not even, okay. We're gonna put all this stuff in a little cubby. And we're gonna parse the block. And then, and that's going to go into a different place because this doesn't exist yet. Oh, like we even, what? We even assign it anyway? That is so weird, dude. Okay, we're just going to start doing random things to clean this up. Oh, geez. Okay. Okay. Um, what I'm realizing is among the many things that may change but are weird currently is that things get their enclosing scope set in the parser sometimes. And so if we can't like copy the block because somebody will have the wrong enclosing scope pointer. And that would be bad. The tea's actually okay. This is not as nasty when you let it steep for a while. This is drinkable. The apple spice was not drinkable. I'm starting to get tired. You know, I'm good for about two, three hour streams in a day. I don't know why it takes so much energy to stream, but it does. Okay, so There are two ways to do it. One is bite the bullet and radically change everything. And two is to incrementally crawl from the current program to the final program. And I, I feel like doing the second one. Um, but what that's going to do, so let's, let's just leave this here. And we're going to move the other part because the other part is actually the part that like Matt, let's make sure we didn't break anything and all that moving around of stuff. I just deleted and undeleted and moved and unmoved and whatever. Okay. Okay. So for all the modified directives, we are making parameter declarations, adding them there. Um, Where do we turn off the do not infer yet flag? That, I'm expecting to see that. Because we turned it on. Build arguments and returns for modified directive. That is here in line 4384, which is totally Totally different. That's a struct modified directive. Oh, there's one here, 2650. Okay. So yes, 
Um, we are doing that. We're going to have to move that because we don't want to call that from parser necessarily. So we need to move this. Take it out of parser, build arguments and returns, and do that. And, uh, we'll put it in, put arguments into lambda. Is that an asked? Yeah, so we'll put this with that because, the, oh my god, look how big that is. Okay, we're gonna put that here. And we're going to declare this up here. Bam. And I don't know. Uh, OK, so then build arguments and returns for modified directive. Okay, so we're just going to factor that to a different location, and we're just going to be very paranoid about running tests every time, because modified directives are squirrely. Okay, bam, and bam. Okay, success so far. Now, we actually, okay, this is the struct one, which we're not gonna touch. This is the lambda one. Um, I don't think this is true about bakes anymore. Oh, well, it won't. Okay, wait. Let's work if we don't copy the modified directives per polymorph. Um, yeah, a lot of this, some of this has changed and some of it will change. Okay. Um, this, we're going to be, uh, so what was that one called? Uh, build arguments and returns for modified directive. Like, it's so weird, like, Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, um, finish making procedure. Like, I want to say something that's essentially the same thing as build arguments and returns for modified directive. Okay, we'll go for uh, procedure modify directive. Build arguments and returns for procedure modify directive. Um, lambda interp, okay, and uh, we're just going to do this. Oh, for directives, right, for Procedure modified directives. 
That S is going to make all the difference, dudes. And for now, we're just going to stick this here. It's going to get moved into another file. OK, so um, void Okay, maybe that needs some more variables. Let's find out. Make print. Oh God, I this got all screwed up. Error list. Go away. How do I just? How do I say never? Never. I have to go into some stupid ass set. Yeah, it's gonna come back every time. God. How do I put it? Like I'll put it there and make it really small <laughs> okay um let's see can we even scroll it off oh yeah oh yeah that's great okay um make parameter declaration is a method of parser probably that's annoying there's like multiple overloads and who even knows. Um, okay, this is a string version. So it's this one. Problem is this is the parser's private allocator. Um, We're going to want this to be different anyway. Oh my God, dude. Yeah. Um, this is, are we the only people who call this? No, of course not. Right. Make parameter. Um, lamp, well, no, that's us, parse run directive. There's literally one other place, and it's parse run directive. And well, let's let's double, double, triple check. But like it looks like a lot because the thing is calling itself, and you have the header declarations. Like five lines of this are one overload calling the other overload. Let's just look again. That was parse run directive. This is overload calling another overload. This is uh, what we're doing. This is uh, also what we're doing. Wait, what? Yeah, okay, we do it here and we do it here. Okay, um, and that's it. This is a comment. So step one, everybody just calls one overload, so get rid of the other overload. And then we'll see how much more we could simplify it. Okay. Make parameter. Declaration. Are we, are we triple sure? No, actually this one, this one uses the other overload. Dang it. Wait, name, inst copy, yeah, it uses the other one. But we don't want to use that eventually. That's the funny part. Okay. Um, we're just gonna, um, oh, whoops. I thought it was in the other editor. 
We're going to take these out. These are no longer members. So they're going to change a lot. Um, I'm going to pass the interp. That means it'll use a different memory pool, but that's fine. There shouldn't be any real performance impact, I don't think. Um, OK, so uh, get memory. What is it called? Just let's. Is this really what we do? I'm fine with it, but um, get memory new, new get memory sized, whatever type. Okay. So people who call this need to pass this and it needs to be visible because this is frickin' C++. All right, so here we're going to have uh, no check-in, move, and consolidate these. Where are we now? Copier, oh no. Okay, we'll have to look at that. Get memory new, get new, get memory sized. This is the fun part of macros. Oh, we need to pass interp. Duh. It's like, why does it say all the other error? It just makes it more confusing. Okay. All right. So this is interp. I thought I just fixed that. Okay. Now we start getting into issue. Okay. Um, we need to pass the enclosing scope. We probably also, this probably had a default in the header file. Does anyone pass that to true? I kind of feel like no. Oh yeah, this guy, okay. Fine. Um, let's put it here so it's easy, hard to miss. So, that is going to mean this and this. And then pass that on. Um, oh, we need that here as well. Hmm, no. Um,
This might not be totally right, but it, maybe. Yeah. So we pass that here and there. All right, I hit the wrong thing. There we go. Okay, enter. That's that's not a thing. And then parser new again down there. That's that's a get memory new of interp. Uh, Laxer make ident. Atom of type name. Yeah, we're not we're not going to do that with the lexer directly. So I think interp just has a make atom. Yeah, it's just not cached. That's fine. This is a rare thing that we are doing, and if we want it to be less rare, we can cache the most common type, which is known in advance. Um, interp and close it. I thought I passed this. Row. All right. So now, why are we saying copier? Because we're copying the type instantiation. Okay. This is really stupid, but it's going to go away. We're the whole point of moving this is so that we don't have to pay attention to the. T right, we won't need this. So, um, well, I believe we say get available. Can we get available parser? Available parser. We're in the parser right now. It's weird that the copier is attached to the parser. That's, wait. There's a copier there. They both have one, okay. We're going to do this. By the time we're done moving this, um, we're going to be inside the typer, so we won't need to get one from some remote place. Uh, but all this, all this stuff can go away eventually, I think. How does it go? Interp get available typer. Okay. What's going on? Does not take one art. Eh? Why don't I read the code that I do? Get avail. There's, oh, there's no, right. Duh, because it knows who it is. Okay. Auto copier is typer copier, and then in C++, you have to change the dot to arrow. Okay. Boom. And we compile. All right. Pretty sure I spelled enterp instead of interp. How many hours ago was that? All right. Okay. So we appear not to have broken anything critical. We'll see. We'll see. Don't say that till the test finish.
Okay. Now, we're just going to check this in. Uh, step one of moving modify, modify procedure fill out. Oh no, we still have a no check in, right? Because, yeah. Uh, we don't need to worry. This is going to be step two, is going to be doing that anyway, but. Uh oh, did we lose internet? Looks like the internet is being flaky. So I hate to say this, but that seems to happen when I do a commit often. We start dropping frames. I think Comcast has gone into gerbil on the hamster wheel mode with their customers while everybody's at home. And like my bandwidth is super limited, even though it's not supposed to be or something like that. You know what I mean? Cause like, that's not a coincidence. So improved over their normal mode. Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe so. QoS config in the router may help. I pay them to give me quality of service. I don't pay them for me to program their router. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> I'm getting tired. Um, on the one hand, I want to plow through this. On the other hand, I feel like this is the kind of thing that is better done when I'm fresh. So I think that that's going to be it for programming for now. And we're going to pick it up. We're going to pick it up later. Did I implement calling macros inside structs? Oh yeah, a long time ago, a long time ago. Any final on topic questions about what we did here? It's not Miller time because we didn't finish. It's only Miller time when you finished. We didn't finish, we made good progress. We're breaking this out of the parser and we're gonna put it uh, in the typer. And then um, when we put it in the typer, the amount of code should shrink because all this type instantiation stuff uh, is really shouldn't happen. This is again, when I was first making the language, I didn't know how things were going to go. 
Um, like this, the, the copier stuff that you saw where we copy the type instantiation from the source thing, all that is kind of nonsense. You don't want it because it'll just cause problems actually. So um, it is much better. I, so now that I have a clear picture of how the language works, I know much better how to do that stuff. And it's just, I want to do it, you know, when I'm fresh. Oh, I'm kind of full, man. I, I don't want to make a chai. We could play some of the games, though. We could switch over to gaming mode. What was the problem with Make Adam Cached? So Make Adam Cached is on the Lexer, right? The reason being, okay, an Adam is just an identifier stored in a global hash table, so you don't have to keep making identifiers all the time, right? And so that you can compare them quickly. You don't have to look at the strings. You just say, is the pointer to this one the same as the pointer to that one? Um, now, well, or that used to be the case. It's not really the case anymore, unfortunately. Um, but it is, it, you know, it saves memory and means if you need something else to have the same name as another thing, you don't have to, like, make the new string or whatever, right? So, um, well, the parser makes almost all the atoms, right? Because it does almost all the identifiers. You might have some identifiers come in from, like, the the runtime system making new ones for whatever purpose, but most of it comes from parsing, right? And so, well, how does that happen? Well, the lexer gives you a token for an identifier. And when you put that in the syntax tree, if you just use that same atom, that's better than copying it speed-wise, right? So the lexer itself makes most of the atoms. And so if it just has its own uh, atom table locally that it just spins on and it doesn't have to coordinate with anybody. That's maximum speed for threading purposes and all that, right? Now, the reason I said that it's not just a unique pointer anymore per identifier is that every lexer right now has its own atom table. And then, and then the global this interp struct has its own. And so if you make things outside the parser, you use this guy's atom table. If you make things inside the parser, then that particular parser's lexer, because each parser runs on its own thread, that particular parser's lexer makes the atom, right? Um, and that's just for maximum speed. Now, uh, so when we took this code out of the parser, it's still like happening in the parser, but we're able to take it out now. Um, it was using the parser's data structures, including making the atom using the lexer's atom table. And we don't want that, right? Because we're going to be doing this at a different time. We don't have easy access to the lexer, but even if we did, you would have to synchronize with the lexer in order to get the atom in a thread safe way. And that's terrible for performance. So it's much better to move this elsewhere. That's all. Did using a fuzzer help improve the compiler code quality much compared to just using handwritten tests. Um, yes and no. So I think fuzzers are very, very useful. The one that we have so far, it kind of got stuck in this pathological mode of just spamming the, spamming the parser with really, uh, what do you call it, hostile inputs, which is useful for a certain kind of thing, right? And it did come up with a number of bugs that we have fixed, but the problem is that doesn't really test the paths of the parser that people are going to use. <laughs> and it doesn't test the semantic parts of the compiler at all because it ends up just generating things that don't get past the parser. So we really need to fuzz semantics and we really need to fuzz programs that look like user programs. And we don't do that yet. But the, the fuzzer that we had so far was useful for sure. Um, yeah, um, is there anything else to say about the fuzzer? I don't know.
I mean, what I would like is to make a fuzzer that's like really serious. Like you could almost just do some neural network thing that just kind of outputs programs. You know, it's trained on the programs that we have. We have, you know, I don't know how much code. We have at least 150,000 lines of code, right? You could like train a neural network on that stuff and just get it to generate those. And maybe most of them wouldn't compile past the parser even, but but a significant percentage of them would. And then you can just run that 24 seven and look for um, errors, right? Chai time, I ate so many Reese's pieces today. I wanted to do a chai, we'll see, we'll see. We're gonna start some games and we'll see if a chai will help. Mm. Okay, I am so happy that we will ship this many fixes to the beta users. We're gonna ship more than this because we're gonna do some more documentation tomorrow. This modified directive thing may not be done tomorrow. Um, maybe it will, maybe I'll, maybe I'll finish it off stream. Um, but like, look at the, is so many fixes and good things. And then this might be the longest one ever. It's the longest single change log ever, man. All right, let's do some gaming. Let's, what games did we download the other day? What did we download? Library. Rise to Ruins. For the King. Environmental Station Alpha. I think we start with Environmental Station Alpha and see how that goes, and we could do Bad North. Let's try it. Like I said, I might have done Environmental Station Alpha before. Um, You didn't put fixed stuff in the change log. Yeah, that's true. Play Doom Eternal. I don't want to play Doom Eternal. It's just not appealing. Admirable how productive you're able to be. You're just addicted to internet right now. So at the beginning of the, of the shelter in place time, I was not that productive for about a week and a half to two weeks. Part of that was that I had worked all through November, December, January. Like in December, I was like, I'm just going to work through Christmas and get a bunch of stuff done that I need to get done. And I'll take a vacation in late January, early February. Of course, January, February came around and I still had to do way too much stuff, right? Um, so not only did we have this weird shelter in place thing happening, but like I never got my vacation, <laughs> right? And I like being able to take a break. I still end up programming on vacation, just maybe not as much and while doing other interesting things. So, you know, I just felt like I'm just going to veg for a little bit and just see. And there was like a Counter-Strike tournament going on. So I was watching that. And like Counter-Strike games, you start watching those, you know, you watch a best of three and like four hours goes by or something. And you're like, whatever. Oh, now there's a new best of three coming up. So that was happening. Um, so there's about a week and a half to two weeks when I didn't do very much. And that was sort of my non-vacation vacation. vacation. Um, but then it's time for that to end and it's time to crank, you know. Flights are real cheap. So are hotels take a vacation. Of course, there's nothing to do while you're anywhere. Yeah. What I might do is as soon as some place opens up, I might go there. So like if Las Vegas opens up early, which it might because it's so, uh, so uh, you know, the money figures there are very big in terms of what they're losing daily. Um, I might like go there and not go to any casinos or anything because that's bananas, but just like, go to some some ranges and, and practice shooting or something, you know, um, just as a vacation. It'll have to be first because everyone else is thinking the same thing. I'd give it a couple days and see if people are doing that for sure. 
because I don't want to be around a ton of people. Like, I don't want to spread disease, right? Um, but here's the problem with our current situation that very few people are talking about. There's no freaking plan. Like, nobody at federal or state or city government level is able to articulate any plan, right? Shelter in place makes sense as long as it's giving you time to fix the problem, but we're not really doing that. It's not like we're even flattening the curve because flattening the curve would involve getting more people sick than we are getting sick in California so that they use the existing hospital capacity. Like hospitals are empty in California right now, so we're not even flattening the curve. We're just delaying when everybody will get sick. So if we like open up to normal levels next week, it's just as bad as if we never shut down unless someone has been making preparations that nobody knows about, right? Because it's just, it's like, it's just going to spread just as fast if you have people doing their normal things, right? So, I mean, maybe people will be wearing masks and that helps some, but um, it's not, this is not an intelligent plan that is being followed, right? And the problem is, as soon as you say that, you get attacked by dumb internet people who say, but you have to blah, blah, blah. Do you want people to die? And it's like, no. And that's why I want us to be following an intelligent plan. And we are not doing that right now. Um, it's just, again, it's lack of adult supervision at every level. So, um, I don't know. I don't know. South Korea and Taiwan are open, uh, in Singapore as well. Like I could see if I thought we were going to be closed for another two or three months, I could see me just going to Singapore and quarantining in Sy Singapore for two weeks and then just chilling in Singapore after quarantine, you know, cause that would be more fun than being here in a place with no plan. Yeah, the way people are like attacking Elon Musk in a really weird way is it just removes my faith in humanity, man. And it's a real concern, okay? So not only are people saying, oh, this lockdown is necessary, right? People are starting to say, oh, this might be the new normal because there's new diseases that are going to come every couple years. It's like, excuse me, what? Wait, what? So like if you wanted to turn America into a fascist police state and we have accepted permanently that this is a justification for everyone to stay locked in their houses and that it's illegal for them to go places, all you have to do is intentionally manufacture a virus in a lab every few years. And now you have an excuse to keep everybody locked at home forever. You know what I'm saying? So like if you're actually a, f a robustly free country, you have to not accept that excuse. Otherwise it gives people including people in your own government who want to make it no longer a free country, it gives them an algorithm for turning your state into a fascist state. And that's not a good idea, and nobody's admitting that. Okay? That is not okay. So that's why I kind of don't, don't feel so good about the lockdown now. I was totally, I was way ahead of it. I started, quote, sheltering in place way before, uh, I stopped going out dancing for many weeks before, uh, before people admitted publicly that this was a, an issue and that we would need to stay home. The problem is just now that we're doing this, we're not doing it for any reason. It's not helping. All it's doing is delaying the problem. It is not solving anything. It's delaying. Well, it's worse because it's delaying the problem at the cost of completely wrecking the economy. Right? So what's the deal with that? And even if it were helping, that would be stupid because we had two months of advanced warning anyway. So we shouldn't have wrecked the economy. We should have gotten ready for two months and then been on top of it. So, but even ignoring that, we're not solving anything. If we go back to normal, everybody's going to be just as sick because it's going to spread just as fast as it is spread faster, actually, because there'll be more than a couple incubation point initial uh, points. Um, so, well, what do we do when we open up? Well, you keep social distancing, but maybe restaurants are open and whatever, and you wear masks a little bit in public, right? Um, we could have done that two months ago without locking down. 
we could do it instantly today because we know we know that this lockdown is actually excessive, right? It's not getting anyone sick. If you don't get anyone sick, you're not flattening the curve, right? So that it doesn't make any sense. Um, the only way this could possibly make sense is if you think that like the Oxford vaccine is going to work and be ready like in July <laughs> and mass producible and cheap and everybody can get it, which, okay. I mean, there's some probability that that's true. I hope that that ends up being true, but I don't think it's very likely. If nobody is getting sick, the curve is not flattened. It's literally the opposite. No. If nobody gets sick, the curve is not flattened. The curve is time shifted. Time shifting a giant curve does not help. I did mean to say that. You have to understand what I'm saying. If nobody is getting sick, you are not flattening the curve. Because flattening the curve involves getting people through who need to get through the healthcare system, through the healthcare system without saturating a healthcare system's capacity, all right? And the whole reason that that supposedly works is because once you get sick, you're hopefully immune most of the time, all right? That makes sense. That's a plan. Okay, we're going to flatten the curve. We're going to keep the rate at which people get sick below the capacity. If the rate at which people get sick is essentially zero, which it almost is in California right now, compared to the population, you're not flattening the curve. You're just delaying the problem. People need to understand that. Apparently, no, you're not. I mean, actually, supposedly you are. I don't know. You've heard conflicting things about it, but um, I suspect people who have been infected most of the time have an immune system that will fight it off afterward. Alternative government gets their shit together and actually builds capacity, PPE stock up, testing and contact tracing in place. Yes. And you know what? It's been two months. Why haven't we solved all those problems, dude? Like what? We're still sitting here on our butts with like the same things happening as two months ago. So we're four months in. We've had four months of warning and we're sitting here doing nothing. It's, there's, there's no adult supervision. And Denmark restaurants are allowed to do takeaway. Yeah, I mean, you can get food delivery from restaurants here. Um, and there's some limited places. Like there's one Starbucks that I know of that's open where you can order stuff for takeaway. Um, but most things are closed. So I don't know what the different, I don't know how that's decided. Yeah, Sweden is not doing any official quarantine and um, they have a higher rate of fatalities than neighboring countries. Um, but, so that might be because they're not doing a good job. It might be uh, because they're just further in time than uh, the neighboring countries in terms of addressing this thing. Because again, if nobody gets sick, you're not flattening the curve, right? So... I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed at all this, uh, which is why, um, why I'm annoyed at all this. <laughs> okay. Sweden's healthcare is excellent. Um, I've heard conflicting statements about that. I don't know because I've never, I've been to Sweden like twice, maybe once. Um, I've been to a couple places in Sweden. I just don't remember if it was on the same trip. Oh, I'm starting to get hungry. That means there might be a chai in the books later. I'm just going to regret the caffeine again. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are not trustable because the algorithms by which people measure in different places is different. So maybe Sweden's numbers are higher because they're honest or more accurate at counting. I don't know, right? I don't, I'm not willing to judge that at all. All right. We're gaming. Should I play this on a gamepad? 
Okay, this is loud. Does, does your volume go down when I turn down the desktop volume? I assume it does, and now I need to turn up the OBS volume. Let me try plugging in a controller. Still loud? Okay. controller I could find in the cupboard. It was an Xbox 360 controller. I got rid of my Xbox 360, but I still have an Xbox 360 controller for some reason. This game has very large pixels. Yeah, they're still smaller than Pico 8 pixels, barely. I feel like... Okay, is, uh, okay so my controller is not doing anything. I suspect it's not being detected, but let's uh, let's see if it detects on startup, or maybe this is just not a controller game. I could have looked in Steam at controller support. Okay, we'll see. Settings. Gamepad. Why don't you like my gamepad? Are you only X input gamepad? PlayStation controllers at home. I thought I had a modern Xbox One. Don't know where it is, so I guess we're playing on keyboard. Uh, third button. Wait, what? Oh. I have to turn it on. Okay. I thought it was grayed out because... It wasn't active. Let me, does this mean I can D-pad? Oh, I can D-pad. Okay, no, we're in business. Um, okay. Start game. It's very inconsistent in what button you press to activate things. Normal. Why do I have no audio? Oh, it's because I plugged in a USB and that confused everything. It's going, it's going to the headset earphone on the controller. Now I think I have to restart the game because it, oh no, there we go. So now do you have that? That's like, dude, I don't know what button eight is. All right. Oh no, I knew that was gonna happen. My brain was playing that out in slow motion. I was like, oh, it's gonna come at me now. Thought too slow. Right. Oh, jump. Okay, so it is it is a hold the jump situation.
Gee, we're going to open this and go down later in one of those giant Metroid shafts. Oh, man. back online. Yes. Alert. Defense system. It's the, oh, ow! He landed right on my butt. So, the jump button is in a very, it's in a very awkward place. Oh, it balanced, dude! My health is so low, I'm a noob! I can already tell the boss battles in this game are gonna be long and drawn out. Like, the jump button is on square, and... Okay, we're gonna change this. If I could figure out... How do I get to settings? Let's do it here. Can I not do that? Do I have to, like, quit out? Let's at least save our game. Yep. Invisible wall, man. Oh, I could have gone left right there, probably. decibels should I lower the volume? Why is my d-pad not working? Do I have to go out of the thing? What, what's going on? Why do video games do this? Oh, wait, my focus was on another window? Was that it? The cursor was on another... The cursor was over another window so the gamepad wouldn't work. Video games, everybody. Gamma decibels. Alright, we are checking out environmental station alpha. That thing down there is going to drop on my head. Oops. Oh. Bro. 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 
bro. Not the way it should go, bro. This is like Jump King right here, man. But why did I go up here? There's nothing up here. Except like, this is like a secret. Oh, I could have done that. There is a save computer machine, but I gotta come from the other way. All right, linear, it wants me to go right. if I play this. Oh my god, it's Fish World. Oh. Put you down. Put you up. Casey would be glad to know that there's Fish World in this game. That's all I can say. For some reason, you can't push the same button. Like, you press one button to activate, and then a different button for next. It's a boss already! Oh no, it's okay. I'm okay. There's a big X up there. That's going to be something. Later when I get more Metroid powers. I really don't like the Metroid thing of like just redoing the enemies every screen. Like if there was a spawner that just generated them once in a while, I'd be fine with that maybe. Ow, ow! I, I shouldn't have run into that. Okay, this is not... How it should go. You know what? Let's not let's not hang out down there. I just wanted to see what those guys were like. shouldn't have fallen down. Now I have to go to Fish World again. Special access code Alpha Alpha Alpha. Yeah, this is the very beginning of the game, and I'm already at four health, so that's good. No! No environmental situation help. No! Okay, so we go up from here, not down. Don't miss the Jump King jumps. Uh oh. So do we go right? I don't know. It's a Metroid. I don't like this. 
guy. So does that just open certain kinds of like vault bay doors? That's a little thing that gets toggled on later. So I can go through that now. So I, whoops, if I had gone this, if I had gone this way, then I wouldn't have been able to go. I would have only been able to go down. to that secret tunnel up there. Zero? Why, why is Queen Beetle's mighty carapace... Oh my god, I'm taking so much damage. I don't... I don't know how to fight Queen Beetle. I need a better weapon. Like, what... Like, now I don't know, am I supposed to get something? Or was I just supposed to wait for an opportune time to shoot? Like, I don't... I need, like, a beetle armor piercing super weapon. There's a happy face! Wait until it drops to the ground, shoot its eyes. I thought I did that. At least once. Can't wait till I get a double jump, I tell you what. Okay, we're gonna, gonna go back and heal, cause eyes are shut. Looked like its eyes were open. I don't know. Oh, God, dude. Bro. I don't want to be pre-hurt when I go visit my beetle friend. Oh. No. Oh, God. See, it's over here. Since we're over here, Dude, I suck. Oh my god, I didn't know that was solid. Not solid, I mean. Okay, now we need to find an, another health station. Dollars. S. Save. Sign. Okay, health station alpha. Great. That's good for us. Extra health. Extra max health. Yeah, baby, that'll help. See, I could play environmental 
station alpha. I can play environmental station alpha. Okay. So Can't wait till I get the swimming in slime suit. I look fishy. Button? What happens when I step on that? Nothing. Well, I can't jump high enough to go there, can I? No. No, I cannot. Sometimes in Environmental Station Alpha, you can't environment the station. Oh god, sometimes you just keep forgetting and going in the water. was a hit yes that did not do very much damage unfortunately oh my god we got to get good ow her eyes were open I don't know what you guys are saying about eyes open I'm at half health by the way Ow. I'm totally winning. Look, I don't I don't know if you guys noticed this, but I am winning this fight. Okay. Oh, that was that was a good jump. That was a tactical tactical jump. What do you guys mean by eye open or closed? I just see some freaking pixels. Okay. You mean when it's glowing? Because I swear it's open the whole damn time. So when her eye is glowing is the vulnerable time. Ow! So dodge on like the fourth or fifth one. Okay, that I meant to jump. Alright. It has to be flashing. Alright. That makes a lot more sense. Why don't I have my 14... Oh, I didn't save with the... I didn't save with my environmental station... station module. That's a good, you know, it's a good non-sedate effect. Alright. Let's do this again. Oh, man. Okay, okay people. That's just how it was. Fight the little babies as they come down. We're gonna shoot her in the eye when it's flashing. Oh, that wasn't the shoot button. Okay, it helps that I'm not trying to shoot her at other times. Okay, we're winning. We're actually winning the fight. 
Because she didn't do that point of damage that I have. Oh, took that right in the face, though. All right. We're still winning, I think, maybe. The babies are not winning. The little baby bugs are the unmitigated losers of this fight. Babies? Why Why do you keep... It's like you're playing Dungeon... Ow! Dungeon Warfare 2. Oh, I just jumped right into that. Okay. I think I'm still winning by a little bit, though. Nope! No babies! Nope! Oh, the babies! I can actually stand there... I might be able to stand there while she's lobbing all of those, because they might all go frickin' over my he head, which is a concept that... Oh, come on, babies. There you go. All right. Same spot? Well, we'll see. Wait. This is the same room. This is... This is... See, we went all the way around, and... She was just right there. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Caro Blaster is on Steam. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I get boots, jump booster, AKA double jump. Oh yeah. It's like uh, commander video. I got commander video shoes. Ow, let's, let's refill on that. I need a gun for people who pathologically don't aim. Kara Blaster is a C64 game. It is Commander Video, dude. Totally. Oh, I thought that was a standable. Ow! Okay, I didn't expect that bug to drop. It's a little baby ladybug bug. I don't want to fight that. Let's me scale walls. It's like a worm from an Edmund McMillan game. Ow! Look, leave Commander Video alone. Leave Brittany alone. Wait, this is just back where I was. Oh, okay, this sucks. Well, that's fine. What do we do from here? Oh, there were some places that if I could Commander Video Jump, I can get to now. Like on the right here. That was fishy. can't get up there. I'm going to the right. We're just going to jump right and hope there's not slime. Okay, well. 
can I get from there to... Let's try this. Ugh, barely not? I mean, maybe if I time it... No, I don't think so. Those look like they're going to drop on my head. Do these shoot? What? Oh, I can go in front. Okay. Those totally look like active foreground objects, people. Maybe they are later in the game. I don't know. Okay. This looks like a boss or something that I'm going to regret being at because I have no health. this on, please. Wait, did I take damage from being in Volcano? I need the Volcano suit. Well, I hope there's a health station up here. Or down. S. We like the letter S. So those are something else. Right. Wait, do I have like one point of armor? What is that square down there? Okay, I need to be able to phase through this or run or something. Oof! I thought I was going to be past that. Oh. Bro! Oh, bad news. Okay, we're, uh... We're going to go over here for a second. Just... You know, I forgot to, uh... Turn the oven off. Okay. Great. I could have just ridden up on it. Honestly. Oh, no, let's not do that plan. Okay, you don't actually need to step under it. You just need to be near. Oh, dude, it just. Contact hurts you. Oh. I don't like these. Was that a springboard? No. That was me. Okay, well. This has been entertaining. More pink elevator. Like, that thing seems like a thing. Is there an S over here? I know where I am. Actually, I think that's a different boss. Okay. Lot of HP. Woof. Woof. I try to go under fast, didn't work. Going under fast. Okay, we need an S. There's one.
Oh, he jumps! Oh, good thing I wasn't on my last health. Alright. Okay, I cannot do this challenge. Or maybe I can. I don't think I can, though. Do these, like, explode when you contact two? Or something cool? No. I mean, I feel like this is a thing that I should be able to try to do, but maybe not. Maybe I have to come down the other side. How do I get a map? I'm hitting all the buttons. Okay, one of them. Save point. That's the something. Elevator room. Things. Things. See, the problem is, when things are blocked, I don't know. Spaceship. Class C Guardian. Oh, that is the first one. Where I was. Yes. Or no, that was down here. Teleport. You spoiled for me that those are teleports. All right. got to go up from here. I'm using my commander video powers to go up. Oh boy, okay. <clears throat> so the puzzle is, well, I need to not blow those blocks up unless I want to get on top of that thing. And then I do want to blow them up. Oh, come on. Why not? Okay. What is this guy? Is that just a friendly butterfly? Oh, wait. That, okay. Okay. Rock, rock monster. Down, down, froggy. It was a rock monster that hit me for two points of damage. All right. So that's a one-way gate. I can't seem to get up over here. So I'm gonna go through. I'm hungry. We're gonna be making some chai today. Ow! Wait, are those evil daisies? Evil ceiling daisies? Ow, oh, yes, okay. This is harder than George Broussard's frickin' rain game. Okay, I don't understand the daisies. The underwater sector has become hostile. How about the daisy sector? Am I talking to? Is that still someone on my ship? Okay, I can shoot the daisies in the daisy sector. I don't know if I'll make it out alive because there's no... Let's look at the map. Okay, I have to get over there. There was a rock. Monster! Most people in chat have no idea what I'm even talking about. Because they don't actually know the real 1980s. They just know the Ready Player One 1980s. They don't know any actual 80s music.
Oh, is George in chat? Maybe not. You own a Kate Pearson. Okay, that's legit. That's legit. I do not own a Kate Pearson album, so you win. So what was to the right here? Oh, Frogland. Um, and I am given to believe that I just should not attempt this. Like maybe I can land on that thing? But I kind of don't have the health to try it. We'll try again in a minute. Ow, okay. Bad plan to ignore that guy. Maybe I can squish him. Okay, we're going to the S land. This land is my land. This land is S land. Saw them live supporting another 80s band. They were awesome. That's good. Aren't they still around? Or maybe they just stopped touring, like, recently? Like, the B-52s, they were always, like, a little bit old, but they've been hanging in there, man. Environmental Station Alpha. Ow. Okay, uh, I, I should have landed on those, but I did not. So now, now we're in, in. Now we're somewhere. How do I activate the teleporters? the access card, right? I don't have the access card. What good is this teleporter then? It's a stupid room. Look like I should be like walking around down there. Yeah, rock set is a bad situation. Like, okay, why would I want to go to that teleport? Let's think this through. I mean, maybe there's a way to get down there, like with a one square phase. Like, why would you, as the game designer, put a teleport here? It's because... Not because of that room to my left, whoops, but because there would be something here that was a reason. Alright, well, now we're gonna die probably. That's just how it is. Ow! Well, we didn't need to go over there anyway. So. Okay, what was this again? 
this thing. If I had a longer laser beam, I could shoot out what's under that green block. Maybe that's like the power source for the things. All right. Well, there's no alpha-ing at that environmental station. I tell you what, though, my stomach's crumbling a bit. Oh, I, had, I just had to test that. Maybe try it time soon, that's all I'm saying. I'm glad that there's no like Mario coins that you get for killing monsters. That is good. there maybe it's too soon okay can I go okay that's lava world there's an exit to the right down there that I think was unjumpable but I guess we'll try We want to S over here. We'll S here. How do you get health? You find health packs that the Doom Marine didn't pick up. Note that I didn't say Doom Slayer because that's stupid. I said Doom Marine or Doom Guy or Space Marine. That would be great if suddenly I was in a Bon Hawkins and a thousand spikes. Like if that was just part of this game. Now, okay. So I need I need a blue block situation. I want to be able to go to the the map and say blue block situation. Do I have the original 12 inch of Blue Monday that looks like a diskette? No. Um, no. What was I into in the actual 80s? I was not into stuff like Blue Monday. In the actual 80s, when I was in high school, I was into like Led Zeppelin, uh, Pink Floyd. Um, I mean, of newer stuff, uh, Billy Squire. Uh, midnight Oil a little bit, I guess, although that didn't last. Um, oh, Love and Rockets. My brother got me a Love and Rockets album at one point when I was a kid, and I was like, oh, this is great. Or no. I think one of their videos was on MTV and I really liked the song and so he got me the album and I was on, on, a, on an audio cassette tape and I was like, oh, that's great. And so they became my favorite band for a while. Brian Eno, no. No, Paula Abdul. So here's the thing. Paula Abdul's songs are actually kind of interesting compared, comparatively, right? Because they always, or not always, but usually they've got like one more change or break in them, or like they go to they go to some other melody for a while, and they're not just like 
two minutes and 10 seconds of the same thing. So I, I appreciate that. I mean, she's not by any means my favorite musician, but like if it's a choice between Paula Abdul or Banana Rama, I'll take the Paula Abdul. You know what I'm saying? Bowie, I wasn't that into Bo Bowie in the actual 80s, but later I, I listened to some of his stuff. John Cage, no. I don't know. I didn't have very good taste in music in college or in, in high school, apart from like Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and stuff. Like a lot of the 80s stuff I listened to, like I, I liked a lot of the things that were in the 80s that were just popular and wasn't particularly good, you know. I only formed real musical taste later. Did I get into Bauhaus as well? Uh, I did later, um, not in the actual 80s, but in the early 90s I did. How are you supposed to find music in the 80s? That's just it. The way you found music in the 80s was you either watched MTV or you went to the store and saw what tapes they had. And by the way, where I lived, there was no such thing as a, a music store. So you went to like the, the grocery store and saw what they had in their little tape section, which was a thing back then. Um, or you talked to your friends at school. That's how you learn things. We are now we are now entering Chai Station Alpha, or Environmental Station chai -fa. I don't know which of those it is. And you know what? We're even going to make a little bit extra. We're going to make more than one cup of chai. I'm going to make one and a half. We're not going to play BFG Division tonight. You can't play BFG Division for every single chai. That's just not how it is. Or maybe we can. I don't know. I don't actually know. Can you play BFG Division for every single chai? Maybe. We're not gonna like mess with the camera though. This has gotta be way too quiet for you guys, right? Like really. It's a good volume. You sure about that? Sure it shouldn't go louder in a second? <laughs> All right. See, everyone says the volume is good, but that's because they have it turned way up.
Okay, this really doesn't go together. We can't do the milk can every time. blast through Yes. charges up the shot? I don't know. Where are those freaking bullets going? Oh, I did hit him at some point. I didn't notice. I was all confused. I was like, nothing I'm doing is hitting this guy, but some of the hits were hits. Let me start the try again. I 
Shoot the head, that's it? I thought I was shooting... Okay, this game needs better feedback about what is doing damage and what isn't. I thought... Okay, yeah, the health is going down. I thought his head was... I thought that was an invulnerable noise. You know what I mean? And then I was panicking from not knowing what to do, but if I just have to shoot his head a lot, then we have a plan, unlike anyone with the government responding to coronavirus. Which might not be a good plan, because I might shoot the damage. Maybe double the band damage. Ow. that far behind. Ow, why didn't that hit those? I'm trying to spam them. Ow. Uh-oh. Oh, two. I thought I shot that and it didn't do anything, but I guess I'm supposed to hit that. This is what, if you could take the being confused part out of boss battles, it would be so much more fun. This is a totally different experience when you know what to do versus when you don't, right? I just squirted chai juice on myself, so GG's. Okay, we're gonna do a final mix. I just wasn't aiming it very carefully. It happens. Right. Wow, I have so much chai juice right now, chai unjuice. Mmm. So good, man. So good. I should be 
Oh, I should also not get hit by that. How's that for a plan? Also not get hit by those. on half health, it's fine. Come on, bro. Okay, this is not going well. This is not going well. Oh, come on. I jumped a little late and he nails me. Oh. Gotta do better. Is this Pico 8? This is not Pico 8, as far as I know. It's got too many pixels for Pico 8. Are you kidding me? Look at all the pixels. It's high res. Running boots. Okay. Well, look how low we got him. That was almost. Okay, now my controller's freaking out. It's not that hard. You just the, the problem is there's like four different attacks. So it's like, it's just a little bit to know about. That was a cool transition. What do I think about Pico 8 for fast prototyping games? I do not know anything about how Pico 8 works. In general though, the way that I make games, I don't really prototype. 
So prototyping, I used to prototype a really long time ago. I don't do it anymore, so it's not really applicable. Chai is a good drink. Okay. Sword. I need the Merlin sword. I got the... Oh, it's... It's the Merlin sword hookshot. Button six. How do I know what that is? Okay, but I can't jump after. Like, it's separate from the jumpies, so I go jump, hook, jump. Okay, so I'm pretty sure I have not played this before, if anyone's still wondering. Otherwise, I would have long ago said, oh yeah, I did this. All right. This is interesting, because it's a combo between hookshotting and not, and you kind of need to figure out. Oh! You also need to figure out how to not jump king yourself. Is there a point to getting? Oh, I get to the next one. Okay, whoops. Oh, that's nice. Restore my energy. Oh, but it's not a save. I see. It's a limited. It is not a save. Okay, so I need to go across the ceiling. left. He wants me to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth a million years.
Okay, that was just, that was no big deal. That was fine. I keep... Oh my god, I just accidentally quit from hitting the wrong buttons. Why? I don't understand how games manage to do this sometimes. Try it again. I wanted to save my second jump. So go jump, shoot, jump. Ah! That was, that was not the play, um, but this will totally be the play. This is going to be fine. Oh, that, that was not the play. Okay, I was just taking that a little bit cavalierly. It was, that, was, that was not the play. save point, was it? Lava isn't that fun, if I'm being honest. Uh, rip. Like, the controls, again, 
The controls here are not as slippy and weird as in Dank Tomb, but they're not good. Like, if you're gonna do this, the controls have to be better. Oh, they actually are. They just have to feel better. You wanna be like... That's supposed to be fun. That's supposed to be fun. Like, okay. The reason this is totally not good game design is that I have had no opportunity to practice the hook shot and get used to it in a reasonable game scenario. It's just like, it puts you over lava. You miss the hook shot, your penalty is blah, 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 and you don't get to practice it, right? I've barely used this thing. It's very clumsy feeling. And the punishment for missing with it is huge. Secret room in lava pool? Maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Do you want me to sniff around for it? Doesn't. Well, let's see. That was fast. Yeah, so I don't. Uh, this part is not good. Like, it's fine to do this in your game, but you have to have given people time on the tool first. Before you demand them to be good at it, you need to have given them opportunity to develop at it. Otherwise, it's just stupid. Remember Hell Runs and Super Metroid? No, I didn't. I guess I have to jump and not try to rehook. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I can't experiment and try and learn how it works. It, the game won't let me. What am I taking damage from? The lava in the lava room. See, right there, it was the right thing to double hook because the distance was right. You can't really aim the hook. It's like some bionic commando diagonal thing. So like, I guess I have to hook, I have to jump, hook, jump, hook. Now when do I hook the first time? Do I do it high in the jump or low in the jump? I don't know, does it matter? Maybe, like. Okay. All right. in my game design class, um, I mean, maybe you could get a C plus, but probably not. Probably, probably it's a C minus at best. If there, if if in the rest of the game it's still fun, it's a C minus. loot boxes to unlock a higher GPA. Uh, no, that's called bribery. 
But, I mean, if you bring chai to class, that's really good. I don't, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Special considerations have to be made sometimes. So that's one of those problems that you don't see when you're developing the game, because of course you're good at the hook shot because you've been working on it the whole time, right? Like when you're the developer, you're good at the movement in the game because you've been playing it even when it was worse than it is today, because it's originally more gimpy and then you work on it and it's all that. And you're used to all that and it's hard for you to see how it is for somebody else to play it and how unreasonable that is. So. You wonder how they distribute the DKP? Well, it's probably, in my class, it's probably net negative DKP every time. So, whoop. Oh, great, guys, thanks. Telling me that because I can't do it. Alright, well. Yeah, play the games. I missed it. I missed what? Like, let me take damage. Okay, the problem with this game, actually. Maybe this will change as the pacing changes and it goes on, but, um. Like, so far, the respawn stations are pretty close and not hard to get to. That means it's pretty easy to fill up your health at any time. And that means that all the challenges have to be super brutal or there's no chance of dying, right? And so all these hookshot things are like, if you miss the hookshot, you probably die. And like, that's not, that's not good. That's not good game design. It's like, well, in, in rare cases, it's good game design, like Super Meat Boy or something. This is not Super Meat Boy. So like, you want it to be, look, if you hit, the, if you miss the hookshot, it's a serious penalty, which at 14 health, like, I don't know, five HP would be pretty bad, right? It would still allow me to be in the area and learn and try again. But this is bullshit. This is like not, it's not good to say. Oh, fuck. It's like you want to give people the ability to engage with the problem and learn and get better. Okay, that's, when you're asking for them to be good at a game, see this, see, look how hard it is to hit that. Like maybe I do it from down here, yeah, right. Have I played Axiom Verge, yes. Um, I think that's enough environmental station alpha. I'm not having fun anymore. Um, we might try it again later. It's just like I actually I like difficulty based games 
when they're reasonable and, and when the difficulty is uh, done in a good way. Like, I like Super Meat Boy a lot, and that game's harder than this game. But this game just, eh, it's, it's writing checks it can't cash at that point. Now, that doesn't mean, I don't know, maybe there's just a few rooms like that, and I don't like them, and then when I get past them, it'll be good, but, nah. Did I play Overwhelm? No, I don't know what that is. Bad North. Do I play Dark Souls? No. Dark Souls is too broken. Again, like, you know, if you're going to make a game that's really hard like that, your controls have to work. The enemies have to, like, not be sticking halfway through walls all the time. Or else you're like, what the hell is this that I'm playing? No, Dark Souls is super broken. What do you mean? If you make a face like that, you don't have the ability to judge game quality. Because Dark Souls is super broken. All right. Normal. I should have done tutorial because I don't really remember. Let's do tutorial. Wait, that set that is tutorial, okay. It's not just the camera, like invisible walls and loose hitboxes and like just ugh. like gimpy movement. It's just not good. Dark Souls 3 wasn't so broken. I don't think I played that one because I gave up on it before then. Guys, I think we'll take the uphill position. Can they only come up that pathway? I think so. There is a pathway on the path. Whoops. Why can't I QE the camera? Why are my soldiers being killed by three guys at a time? Victory, three coins, nice looking coins. Zero out of two commanders available, because they're wounded, what? Upgrade what? Well, those all cost six. Oh, wait. Hey. 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 Oh, next, next turn. We have to wait a turn.
I mean, three guys getting off of boat versus nine guys on the boat shouldn't even. Should be no possibility. Of course, they just let him get off the boat. That's fine. I don't know what this game considers to be a good idea. Okay, that was clearly not a good idea. So... Alright, well now my guys are going. Ow. What's the rule for what happens? If there is one. Like what? On what basis do I choose between these? This is a thing, like why? The game's giving me a choice. Why would I choose one or the other of these? Like, what, is, what does that mean? Hey. Can I change her picture? I don't like her. Okay, so we don't... We don't have items, I guess. All right. I guess we should go up here to like try to get things. Is it any different from Sokoban? You also have to choose path in your. Yes, it's very different. Are you kidding me? Good night. Just so if we get stuck, we have options? What do you mean get stuck? You just wait till the end of the turn and attack the island again or something. Or do you, once you lose an island, do you lose it forever? How does it work? Deploy. Okay. hit from there? Hope so. Aim better. guys. Hit him! This game feels it's kind of slow right now, honestly. Like, like, I don't get to do that much that's interesting. Put out the fire, guys. Oh, 
So I guess I get more coins from doing all the maps. What is the question mark? Are those enemies? Okay, wait. Is this like... Oh, this is the Wall of Death. I see. Okay. I went here because it had... Oh, local commander. That's what that means. Oh, that probably didn't matter. Um... Okay, Morton. We're just gonna hold down the fort. You guys are gonna go there. Come on, guys, go. Do the thing that I say. Oh, come on. Okay. Clearly, I should have noticed that those are archers and not freaking meleeed them. Okay, we're gonna hold these guys off and then we're gonna attack these guys. Wait, how do I get up? It's up there. so cheap. So question mark guy has archers. Morton. Why would I spend money? Oh. Huh? Wait. Does Morton join us now forever, or do I spend money and waste him? Okay, Virgil. I mean, how do I pick? But these, this looks like more money or more buildings. I don't know. This feels a little too iOS for me. Like it's just, it's just real slow. And like maybe, it, maybe it gets good, but. I mean
Hit him. Hit him. Yeah, it's too iOS for me, guys. Can't do it. Yeah, the archers are bad. Do I have to do something special for the spear guys? Do they go behind sword guys? Cannot fight while moving. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. What? More about right positioning per island and upgrading your troops. I will lose if I keep fighting the way I am. Well, I'm, I mean, I've been playing this game for 20, 25 minutes. It hasn't shown me that. So it's the game's job to show me. We'll play one more. Play one more. Uh, this one has three enemies. all the way? How do I know? Whoops. Oh, that's fine. through. Bad news bears. I keep forgetting that they'll do that. Come on, attack the guy. So this time I'm losing, but it's more, it's more due to misclicking. Like... I don't know. Like I'm just confused about controls right now. Alright, I just sent my archers to fight the melee guys. Yeah. Oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting that I, if I lose the island, I lose. What are my guys doing? Why aren't you go- oh god. Yeah, see that sucks. I was just like misclicking and not caring that time, so I- I lost all my houses. Technically a victory. Yeah, but we didn't get no monies. You need the monies. No, well, I don't know. Maybe we'll play it more later. It just... Not really. What else do we have in the library? 
Rise to Ruins, that's going to take like a long time to play. For the king, that didn't actually necessarily, this could be bad. Hmm. Try it on hard next time. Maybe. It's just like... Okay. So I played, you know, I played five levels or something right there. Four levels, five levels. Um, I still don't really know how to play. Like, how much... If a five or whatever, nine sword and shield guy group goes up against a boat with three guys. What do I expect to happen? I don't know, right? Still. And so I can't make decisions based on that. So I'm just moving guys around, right? Um, you can make the basic intelligent decisions, like don't, don't uh, have your bow guys go melee the sword guys, which I accidentally did. Um, but like... I feel like it's the game's job to communicate a little bit more than it did in the tutorial so that I have some basis for decision making. Because I don't actually know. Like, okay, pikes, pikes are melee and swords are melee, and so pikes are longer distance and more powerful than swords, but they, how longer distance? They obviously don't reach a square because they're graphically like not that big. So, um, I don't know, like, what does that even mean? How far did I get into Dungeon Warfare? Um, it's a bit like FTL where you're expected to mess up and restart. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Like, that's a totally acceptable game design, too. It's just... Um, I mean, maybe this particular game just isn't grabbing me, but also there's just, there's ways to make the messing up experience more, more gripping and more interesting or less gripping and less interesting, right? So like Spelunky, I've died a zillion times and restarted. Um, but that makes, like Spelunky is interesting. To, it's play, interesting to play the first levels, even if you're good at the game. Whereas this game, if I had to start over and play those first levels again, it'd be like snooze. I mean, I don't. I already don't want to play them, and I'm not good at the game yet. <laughs> so there's just ways to do that in design, and I don't. I don't feel them right now. Check full bore if I don't mind some block moving puzzles with context. Um, are they good puzzles or not? What convinces you to keep going into Spelunky? Um, so there are very serious penalties for messing up, but they're, they're survivable in many cases, in most cases. Um, it feels like it's your fault when you mess up in Spelunky. Um, and there's something interesting, like, okay, I just got hit by a spike trap and killed, but I learned what a spike trap is. Like, that's a very interesting thing in Spelunky, and that is not in this game, and it's not in Environmental Station Alpha, necessarily. I mean, maybe that's a little bit in this game, because, like, there were, like, different colored skeletons with different sized shields and stuff, but it was not, like, it was very hard to observe what those different guys are like and whether to what degree that matters. You know, what, is, what do the shields mean? Does it mean I can't archer them? Does it mean I can't sword them and I have to pike them? Does it mean none of the above? Does it mean I need just raw numerical superiority? I have no idea. And it doesn't appear to be observable in any way. Like I can't I can't make conclusions about what I did wrong and come back with a new plan. I'm just guessing. Have I played into the breach? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. 
Into the Breach is good, except it becomes less good toward the end. It's like they didn't understand what was good about their game and they took it away toward the end. I should play more RimWorld. I might. Like right now is not the time to start playing more RimWorld because it's going on midnight. Steam has a tower defense sale. Well, if I know what games to try, then we could try one. If I played Hiding Spot, yes. Okay, so someone suggested Full Bore. What is that? This just looks like poser models or something. Like, I don't, that's so weird. Full bore. So it's like a scapegoat. It looks like a scapegoat. I don't know, is it good? It doesn't. I mean, it might be good, but I can't tell. It doesn't, it looks like it's not good. Okay, I just clicked full screen. Thanks, Steam. Steam is so bad. Okay, full screen videos do not work on Steam. Sorry, guys. My mind and boars don't get a lot of respect. I like to think of them as treasure hunters, cause them gems are a real prize. Those bright, glowing beauties can be mighty hard to get at. But boars under my Mario are coins expected to be tenacious. Recently, the working folk been clamoring about eyes in the dark or yeah, some other such superstition. Can't do it. Was I a fan of Mech Warrior games? Um, I played the pen and paper games a little bit in high school, and had fun. You loved every second of it. Of this game? Can I trust that? Why would I trust that someone in chat says this is an amazing game? I mean, we could try it. It's getting close to bedtime, but... But I have definitely had some people tell me in chat that games were amazing and they were quite bad. So, you know, we'll see. See what happens. All right. Library, full bore. Can't open file, see users, user documents, full bore, saved games xbtn config.dat error 2 the system cannot find the file specified All right. that's a good sign it fortunately still started up okay I'm a dude Okay, that was cute, how it said still a bore. Okay, the controls are terrible, dude. This is unplayable. What? I guess that was supposed to be a sign? Oh my god, this is... jump oh you don't you fall into boar land oh 
if I land in water, it's an old game. This came out like a year and a half before The Witness. It's not that old. I got resurrected. I'm a resurrected boar. I can dig. Oh, these controls are gonna kill me, dude. I'm supposed to go. Lighting feels off. Yeah, it's doing. It's just doing like circles of light. Cyber boar. Good thing the boar can read.
We're back in Boreland, sort of. There we are. There's gonna be a DOS prompt, I'm sure. the vault empty a rocket just went in Seem good. Let's see the edge of the map, I guess. Cannot terminate the boars. I bet if I had a boar driller mine thinger, I could drill that out. Let's reset this. Whoops. This is awkward. Control. So wait, what is this? I guess it's a save point. Then why couldn't I go back to it? 
Okay, so I want to be able to push... See why I don't just do this, honestly. So I don't know what that thing is down there. I think I just need to get the ability to break stuff later. to finish the game. Well, maybe I'm just too tired to think about it right now. Oh yeah, there's that block with the up arrow that I don't know what that means. Well, whoops. Let's figure out the block with the up arrow. Dude, these controls, bro. So it doesn't go up automatically. Well, I guess I want to push it to the right. Might have been a mistake. Maybe not. I don't really know. What I should be doing here. This is not a room you're meant to finish now. Okay. Well, Rip, can't get out. So now, Go all the way okay. All right, so wait, why did that one collapse? Oh, no, don't go. Well, I don't know the mechanics of laser, so I can't do that room. I'm just kind of, I'm a little too tired tonight to do too much wacky stuff.
Oops. That's so weird. I don't think I like this. Uh, it's harder to exploit, but I kind of don't like that floating in air thing. It's a little strange. What do those things do? Does that reset my undo point? I don't really know. I get a second boar gem though. Maybe not. I got a boar gem. So I could have gotten back up. Can I do this? Can I push this this way? Oh. Wait, I can dig that. And I don't get crushed by blocks, I guess. Oh, cool. It's a game about learning what all the different block types are and how they work, and some of them have very interesting and surprising emergent behavior. Okay, I dig it. Shell. That's not good. I can't get the seashell right now. And from here, I cannot get the block. Well, maybe I can, but I don't. I, don't really know. I, can, I can go up these, right? My boar looked really weird there for a second. Whoa, okay. That's actually uh, a more useful map than these games usually have. Can I zoom in? Was Environmental Station Alpha a fun game? I was having fun with it at the beginning, but then I really didn't like its idea of difficulty. You know? I did not dig it. 
so I may have quit the game or I might play it again some other time. Okay, so these are just like push blocks at least. I don't know what else they do with the push blocks. They push a push block forward left. Doesn't help me that. I can't push it over the left anyway. Oh, yes, I could. Oh, you're going to go past that. Okay. I cannot full bore these blocks in any obvious way. I don't understand when can I stomp and when can I not stomp. I guess it's just all sand. Maybe I was confusing the dark brown dirt with the light brown sand. And then... I guess I should have kept pushing that. Right, I should have changed the game name, sorry. This is Full Boar. It is a game about a boar who ate so much that he is now full. Well, I got a gem. So that's progress, but there's a bunch that I don't know what to do with. I need a boar grappling hook. What does this do for me, these crates? I mean, I'm kind of stuck unless I figure something out. Okay, so I can dig the wood crates if they're up against something. Otherwise, I cannot. Okay. And with this one, 
I mean, I could push it over or not, but it doesn't help me being where it is. Okay. So those, were, okay, that's cool. I learned a thing. Bug. I went to try to change the. Okay, you know what? Since we're tired, uh, we're gonna. Actually, we need to find a save point. Tiny screen. No, we don't. We don't need to save point. We're okay. All right, we will play this some more when we are less tired. Alright, if it saves where I got that gem, then that's totally fine. Otherwise we'll just deal. It's not like it's not like we're very far from where we were. Alright, well we will continue that one. Thanks everybody for coming by. We will do some more things in the future. Etc. Have a good night, everybody.